Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York Council hearing on sanitation and solid waste management. If you wish to submit testimony, you may at testimony at council.nyc.gov. At this time, please silence all electronic devices and thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the seventh committee on sanitation and solid waste management hearing of 2022. We'll now start. Um, we're going to be a little bit fast today. We have our commissioner here for about two hours. Um, so we're going to keep things really concise. And for this, um, for council members, we're going to try to stick within the clock just to allow the commissioner the time. Um, okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, committee members, council members, uh, Natasha Williams, council member Chi Ose, council member Jin Gennaro joining us online, DSNY commissioner Jessica Tish. Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner Greg Anderson, um, many of the workers that are here today, zero waste advocates and folks from the private sector, thank you for joining us. In the mayor's management report released last week, the total annual recycling diversion rate for fiscal year 2022 stands at 17%. This falls short of our citywide targets and represents a decrease in recycling diversion rates from the past four fiscal years. New York City can definitely do better. According to the Department of Sanitation's last waste characterization study, the city has the potential to recycle 68% of residential waste, including increasing recycling rates of metal, glass, plastics, paper, and organics. According to DSNY monthly waste tonnage reports, 48.2 million pounds of metals, glass, and plastic, called MPG, MGP, and 44.3 million pounds of paper was collected in just the month of July. This is an immense amount of material and there is more to do first to reduce the amount of waste we produce and improve our individual and collective recycling rates. In October 2020, New York State's plastic bag ban took effect after years of waste advocates fighting to change our city's dependence on this unnecessary and destructive plastic. This is, an this is an example of what we need to be doing more of. We still have more work to do to make sure we put plastic bags and single-use plastics behind us. That is why today we're also hearing intro 0494, a local law in relationship to a study of single-use plastics so that we can better understand the scale of the plastic crisis, a petroleum-based product that is brought to us by the fossil fuel industry. This comprehensive study can provide pathways for new waste policy initiatives that would reduce the sale, distribution, and use of single-use plastic items. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit the Sims Municipal Recycling Facility in Brooklyn. Um, we had a wonderful tour. Um, it's the largest recycling facility in the country. And the tour highlighted the importance of having local systems to help manage our recyclables, as well as the individual roles we are all playing in ensuring we are, we are recycling well in each other's homes. And this is how we will continue to work towards zero waste. I also learned about the dangers of e-bike batteries getting into our recycling stream that could put the entire facility at risk of explosions and fires. And it is clear we need to do more on this issue as it continues to grow. It is important that we truly understand our waste streams and the impacts of sending our trash to be landfilled and incinerated in communities across the region, state, and country, and we need to move toward real solutions. I am concerned about the growth of advanced recycling or chemical recycling for plastics and the dangers that may cause to nearby communities. New York City advocates fought very hard to ban waste incineration or waste to energy facilities in the city in the 1990s, and we continue to be wary of false solutions in the solid waste sector. In 1989, the city first implemented mandatory recycling three decades ago. In 2010, the city passed a law that required us to meet a 33% recycling goal by 2020. Now in 2022, our recycling diversion rates stand at only about 17%. We are moving too slowly on an issue that impacts our city, our environment, and our climate. And I look forward to working with the council, the Department of Sanitation, the sanitation industry, our waste advocates, and our workers to move us toward zero waste and a more sustainable waste management system. I just want to thank my team 
uh, Nell Hernandez, who is my director of climate and environmental policy. I want to thank the Sanitation Committee Task Force, Jessica Albin, Ricky Chala, and welcome uh, our new task force edition, Andrew Lane Lawless. And of course, thank you to everyone giving testimony today. It's wonderful to see the longstanding commitment to waste issues in the city. So now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator to get us started. Thank you, Chair. I will now administer the oath to the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Nurse and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. My name is Jessica Tisch, and I am the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. I am joined today by Gregory Anderson, our Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Strategic Initiatives, and Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon on recycling in New York City. In the interest of time, I am submitting full written testimony to this committee, but I will provide only a brief opening statement. First, I want to remind everyone that we are thrilled to reclaim our position as the operators of the nation's largest curbside composting program next month as we roll out curbside composting to every household in Queens. Collection starts Monday, October 3rd for leaf and yard waste, food scraps, and food soiled paper on your recycling day. The best part is that many Queens residents already separate their leaf and yard waste. We're just asking that they put it out on a different day. And separating food scraps into containers with lids will fight rats and help clean up our streets, closing down the all-you-can-eat buffet that has allowed rat populations to thrive. We are here today to discuss the state of New York City recycling. I am proud to say that our program is strong. It has weathered fiscal crises and global market crashes. And thanks to hundreds of millions in public and private investments, we have state-of-the-art infrastructure to sort and recycle products right here in New York City. Last fiscal year, we collected 616,000 tons of these recyclables from New Yorkers, diverting these items from landfill and helping to create new products. But we can do more. Of all the paper and cardboard in the waste stream, we only capture about 51% of it in the green bin, according to our 2017 waste characterization study. For metal, glass, plastic, and cartons, that figure is 48%. That means that nearly half of everything that could be recycled ends up in the trash. I look forward to discussing our curbside recycling programs with you today including the steps that we are taking to increase capture and diversion rates and the measures in place to ensure that the products New Yorkers separate actually do get recycled into new products. Lastly, regarding Intro 494, we look forward to working with the Council to continue the City's leadership role in taking on single-use plastics. In particular, our upcoming waste characterization study will provide valuable information about the success of past bans on foam products and single-use plastic bags, and we hope that study can also inform our future policy efforts in this area. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important topic, and I am now happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Tisch. Um, I'm going to touch a few topics, then hand it over to some colleagues to get their questions in so they can move on with their days. Um, but I wanted to start with overall diversion targets and rates. Um, according to Local Law 40 of 2010, DSNY is required to meet 33% recycling goal by 2020. Um, I think we all acknowledge some of the major barriers in the way, but we just wanted to hear a little bit more from you all. What are the main barriers to attaining this goal for residential and containerized collections? Um, so I'd say um, three main barriers come to the top of my mind. Um, the first is access to bins. And when I say access to bins, I mean that ensuring that recycling bins are equally convenient and, pre and prevalent 
in residential buildings. Um, the Department of Sanitation has a zero waste building maintenance training program where we train building workers um, on best practices associated with waste management and recycling. The second main barrier in New York City is building design. Many residential buildings were not designed with sufficient space to manage recyclables. They managed trash, they were built when trash was a thing, but unfortunately built before the recycling era. Um, this has become even more of an issue of late with the proliferation of cardboard in our waste stream. Some buildings physically lack the space to properly store and manage recyclables. And the, the third topic that um, I want to raise is around NYCHA. NYCHA um, remains, I believe, a latent opportunity to capture recyclable materials. We estimate that only about 1.5% of NYCHA's recyclables make it into the recycling trucks. Um, I believe that, that the root of that issue lies in the, in, largely in the first two factors that um, I addressed, but in particular in building design. So in NYCHA developments, there is oftentimes um, plenty of or room to conveniently um, manage your trash, so put the trash in a chute there is not the same type of room for recyclables. So NYCHA residents oftentimes have to bring their recycling down outside of their building and into a special container that is not physically within the building, and this is because of, of strength, space constraints. Thank you. I um, wanna recognize Council Member Botcher joining us. Thank you for coming. Um, so, in 2021, DSNY testified that the best approach to increasing rates involves some combination of financial incentives, allowing recycling to be easier. And we had a, we were trying to find if those exist, um, which is a little bit hard to find publicly. Does the city currently offer any financial incentives for recycling certain items? The current financial incentives for recycling really include the New York State bottle bill deposit redemption program, or commonly referred to as the bottle bill, um, and of course the fine avoidance for properly separating out recyclables. Um, those are the two main financial incentives. Great. Um, and we'll ask some questions later, because um, I know we have um, Tony here from Sims, but we wanted to know uh, the percentage of recyclable materials that are placed in the wrong type of bin or if you know papers and with the metal and what happens to those bags um, when there's that kind of contamination so four percent of metal glass plastic is paper and cardboard that should have gone in the, the paper recycling um, and 2.7 percent of paper is metal glass plastic and cartons that should have gone in metal glass plastic recycling um, there a number of remediation steps. Among them, communications campaigns, for example, on social media, um, community and ethnic media. We do periodic mailers to reinforce recycling message, messaging, um, including what should go in what bin, and importantly, to get at this question, what should not go in the bins. We also participate in a statewide Recycle Right working group to coordinate messaging across New York jurisdictions. Um, I would just add that one of the larger stakeholders in remedying this issue is the Department of Education. Um, the Department of Sanitation funds DOE to operate Grow NYC's Zero Waste Schools Outreach Program. It's a fabulous program. Um, common feedback from the public when it comes to recycling is, my kids do this at school, my kids taught me to do this, my kids taught me to separate out my, or my organic waste. And we really feel like messaging targeted at kids in schools, we can, by, by messaging to kids in schools, we can train the next generation of New Yorkers and um, see them influence their parents and families. 
Thank you. I have a question about um, a little bit later on about kind of the impacts of the cuts to those mm -hmm. programs. Um, but I did want to talk about single stream recycling um, only because it comes up in waves uh, in discourse over the years. So single stream recycling enables people to put metal, plastic, paper, and cardboard in the same bag for recycling. So it doesn't require multiple bins. It doesn't require additional steps. And in other municipalities, it arguably has led to higher diversion rates, or they argue that. In 2015, DSNY began to explore single stream recycling for residential waste. And we were just curious if a study was ever conducted and you know, what were the outcomes of that, if so, and then what is the current position on single stream recycling um, from DSNY? Um, beginning in 2015, DSNY worked with SIMS Municipal Recycling, uh, one of our major recycling partners, to conduct a study of the, both the financial and the operational implications of converting to single stream recycling. And as you know, the, the outcome of that analysis was we are one of the few large cities that held firm on dual stream recycling and did not convert to single stream recycling. Clearly, there are some benefits to single stream recycling. Among them, fewer bins to manage in buildings, consolidation of material in trucks, and technically, or on paper, higher diversion rates. However, on the processing side, we found that there would be very high capital costs to retrofit existing recycling infrastructure for single stream recycling, totaling hundreds of millions of dollars in new capital investment. This would also have entailed substantial changes to our recycling contracts to account for the higher cost of processing all recyclables through a state-of-the-art materials uh, recovery facility. Now, I am not afraid of changing contracts, renegotiating contracts, like large systemic important change for the future. Um, but I do want to note that there are some profound downsides to single stream recycling that many cities that have switched over to single stream have encountered. And I think the largest among them is the quality of the end product that comes out of single stream recycling, largely due to contamination. And so when you do single stream recycling, because there is so much more contamination, the products that come out of it have a lower value than they, they would if you dual streamed. In New York City, it is a pernicious myth that things that you put that can be recycled and that go in the proper recycling bin are sent to landfill. That does not happen in New York City. In cities that have single stream recycling, because the value of some of the end products historically has been so low, it is much more likely that recycled material coming out of single stream would end up in landfill. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna to turn to capacity, infrastructure and capacity. So what is the recycling capacity for the New York City region? Who are the major players, facilities, um, and related what sites, systems, equipment, or infrastructure is needed for New York City to increase its rates and we capacity? Have, we have two major partners in, in New York City. Um, one is for paper and one is for metal, glass, plastic, but also they play a role in paper. So the first is Pratt Industries. They do paper. They process New York uh, City paper with their Staten Island paper mill. Plus, they have access to um, additional regional paper facilities as needed. Um, the second partner is SMR, formerly known as SIMS around here and they process our metal, glass, and plastic, um, and they do that at their two materials recovery facilities. One is in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. It is fabulous. I toured it myself right when I started as, as commissioner, and the other is in Jersey City. Um, and I mentioned before that SMR also plays a role in our paper recycling. They receive some of New York City's paper, and they help transport it to Pratt. Um, 
you asked about capacity. So let me start with Pratt. The max capacity at Pratt's facility on Staten Island is 450,000 tons per year. Our material takes up, or DSNY's material takes up about 55% of that max capacity at present. That can fluctuate a, a, a bit, um, but um, we estimate that the Pratt Staten Island facility could take an additional 150,000 tons per year from DSNY with their current capacities. Um, moving to SMR on the metal glass plastic, their max capacity in both their Brooklyn and New Jersey facilities is 382,000 tons per year. DSNY material currently takes up about 78% of that capacity at present. Obviously, that fluctuates as well. Um, but we estimate that SMR could take an additional 82,000 tons per year from DSNY with current capacities. That's about 25% headroom. Um, and I just also want to note that SMR continues to add, and I'm, I'm so glad you went to see it, some state-of-the-art equipment to improve the quality of the bales of recyclables that they sell. Most of these are robots that help pick out contaminants to, com um, to produce cleaner bales for sale. Thank you. And I want to recognize Councilmember Marjorie Velasquez. Good to see you. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, so my understanding also from that trip is that if we were able to better have s better sorting, lower contamination rates, that, that kind of correlates to the direct capacity increase. Yeah, we're always looking to lower our con contamination rate. It just results in a better net product for sale. Right, and so for the ideal non-contamination rate and about a 25% increase, it's not necessarily that there's more capacity, it's just that it would be better utilized. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Okay. Um, I have a question on chemical, oh no, excuse me. Um, so can you describe, um, you know, my understanding is that recycling is dependent on kind of post collected and sorted and bailed commodity markets, uh, other, um, companies purchasing this material for further processing. So does DSNY interact with these markets at all? And, and if so, what impact does it have? Yeah, um, we do in indirectly. It's really through our vendors. So the material that's collected on our recycling trucks is sorted into commodities that are sold on the secondary market. The recycled material competes with virgin material to be purchased and used to manufacture new goods. Virgin material is more homogenous and often can be cheaper than recycled content. And depending on the material, the demand for the recycled content can fluctuate greatly over time. In our contracts, we track recycled commodity prices in industry publications and take into account a three-year rolling average, which smooths the highs and, and the lows, and that obviously accounts for big fluctuations in the market. So when the value of recyclables are high, DSNY shares in revenue of the composite market value of the commodities listed in these trade publications. And obviously, DSNY and our partners, SMR and Pratt, track these markets uh, very closely, and we try to be opportunistic. So um, our partners will adjust the commodities that they are generating to get the most value, depending on what's going on in those markets. Great. <clears throat> and so when the, the the price of the commodity is too low, the where do the recyclables end up? They do not end up in the landfill. Okay. Let's just <laughs> be very clear about that. Um, but it will, it will depend. Our partners will sell the commodities on, on the market. So um, we like to say that a piece of paper you recycle in Staten Island a few weeks later could end up you know, being a pizza box in, in Brooklyn. Like it's, it's that real. And I also want to say it's like very special in New York City that that happens 
here, yeah. that we have the capacity locally in New York City to do that. Um, thank you. I want to recognize Council Member Amanda Farias. Um, and I have a question on chemical recycling, and then I'm going to open it up for some other folks to go. So chemical recycling, also called advanced recycling, includes different technologies to break down the polymers and plastics so they can be made into new materials. Some of these technologies turn plastic waste into fuels and energy, which uh, oftentimes happens through incineration. This can release toxic chemicals into the environment and harm environmental justice communities because these plants tend to be located in low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. So does DSNY have a position on using these chemical recycling techniques? I also want to be clear that we have no plans to leverage chemical recycling at present and also there are no commercially viable uh, chemical recycling technologies um, available. And I want to commit to you here that before we would engage or consider engaging, we would want to make sure that the environmental justice um, concerns are being addressed. But this is not something I see in the short and medium term. And just to confirm, New York City doesn't currently send any of its material to a chemical recycling plant. We do not. OK. OK, great. Um, I'm going to open it up a little bit. Um, did we have any questions from members? OK, Council Member Botcher. Hi, Commissioner. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. In your testimony, you outlined three steps that the city is taking to increase recycling rates. A training of building staff and, and porters, a public education, a social media campaign, and efforts in the schools uh, targeted to young people, and the commercial waste zones reforms, which will prevent private carters from refusing to collect recyclables. Are these steps alone really enough to get New Yorkers recycling. What else is being planned? Because uh, New Yorkers just aren't, they're not recycling like they should be. We see it every day. If you could wave your magic wand, what policies would we be taking to really get a handle on this? I think the biggest opportunity that we have in New York City to increase our diversion rates is around organics. So we know that organics makes up one third of the waste stream. Um, and today, we uh, divert like virtually none of it. I mean, a very small percentage, less than 1%. Um, as you know, we're rolling out the largest curbside composting program in the country. We're starting in the borough of Queens. We're going to roll trucks uh, every week to every address in Queens um, on recycling day. And um, this is importantly, the cheapest recycle, uh, organics program ever rolled out in New York City and the easiest to use. I mentioned that because those are the two drivers that will inform like both the success and I think the scalability of the program. And so our hope um, is that the rollout goes well in Queens that we get some meaningful tonnage out of Queens and that, that Queens leads the way and that we uh, are in a position to be able to roll out beyond Queens and eventually provide like true citywide uh, curbside organics service. I think that that is, will be like the number one contributor in our time here to meaningfully increasing diversion rates. But I also wanna add the commercial waste zones can also be transformative um, in um, affecting and moving in the, in the right direction the overall diversion rate. When we speak of our diversion rate, we're, we're really talking about residential diversion rate. But on the commercial side, like today, commercial carters aren't required to take recycling. The business is re required to recycle. But how does that work if their carter isn't required to accept recycling? 
under the commercial waste zones uh, law, and when the, that program is rolled out, every carter will be required to take refuse, recycling, and organics. And I think those are, frankly, the two biggest and the two newest opportunities. Obviously, training and public education and focusing on our schools, those are things we have done, we can do, we need to continue to do. But if you're talking about really moving the needle on our diversion rate, I'd look to both organics and commercial waste zones as the big drivers. Thanks. Could you give an update to my constituents who had curbside organic service and had it taken away? The residents of Manhattan Plaza, Penn South, West Village houses, when are they gonna get it back? Um, curbside organics resumes, uh, well, the, the new program starts on October 3rd. Queens. In Queens. Right. But what about? And um, I think I'd be getting ahead of myself by giving a timeline for when it's gonna go to Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, but I think it shows um, not just good faith, but real energy and momentum and commitment to curbside organics that we are, roll we're, we're doing the single largest rollout of curbside organics ever in, in New York City. So my hope and my expectation is that the program is successful in Queens and that it be rolled out um, to additional boroughs, but I can't unfortunately give you a timeline. What I can say is we are, it's wrong to say doubling, we're like quadrupling down on our smart composting bin strategy, which has been wildly successful in, in Astoria. What those are are like big orange bins um, that we place on, on street corners and they're for compost material. Um, we're about to roll out an app that New Yorkers can use to get access to the bins and we're going from like less than 40 bins today to 250 bins by the end of the fall across all five boroughs. Do you think that at the beginning of next year you'll be able to give some kind of evaluation to the new Queens program to get this rolled out elsewhere? Well, the Queens program starts October 3rd. It runs through the end of, or through the middle of December, and then we take a pause for the winter when there's not a lot of leaf and, and yard waste out, and we resume in March. I believe that sometime this fiscal year, um, you can have a thoughtful evaluation from us of how the Queens program is going. I am going to be open and transparent with you about how that, that program is doing and you know, perhaps even call, work with some of your colleagues in Queens to make sure that our messaging is out there, that people understand what they have to do. I mean, just to give you a sense of what's going on in Queens, we're going door to door to every household in Queens before October 3rd to give personally information to New Yorkers about how to use that, that program and how, how simple and straightforward it is or it will be to use. So we're really putting everything into making sure that Queens goes right and learning from the mistakes of previous um, curbside organics rollouts. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Botcher. Um, before I turn it over to Councilmember Osei, just while we're on this topic, can you describe a little bit more about the outreach efforts? Um, only because I've had members say, no one's reached out to our office, Queens members, no one's reached out to us to, I mean, I don't know. That's why we're all here asking. Um, so curious about those outreach efforts. What kind of mobilization are you using to hit every door? That's a big, tall order, as most of us up here know about door knocking. And then um, just curious about what was the rationale doing such a short program where you do this massive mobilization to get people in it and then to pause, given the history of the Stop Start program and that being identified as like a major reason for, or a, a, a big reason for why people were not continuing to participate Okay, I'll start with the, the outreach efforts because they truly are massive. Um, so first, 
we did a mailer, which hit a week and a half ago to every household in Queens that very simply describes the program and the service that is being offered. Um, we spend a lot of time designing that mailer because mailers aren't useful when they're not consumable, when you can't just get the information quickly and, and move on. So, so the mailer was, was the first thing. And um, the, the second big thing um, is what I was describing, which is this door-to-door -door canvassing outreach campaign where we are on track to get to every household in Queens by October 3rd. We have over like about 100 people um, going door to door in Queens. That's made up of sanitation employees. We pulled sanitation workers um, or, or members of the sanitation department from virtually every bureau in the department, many members of Bridget's staff, and Greg's staff, and our public affairs team, and they're going door to door. I myself went on one of these um, canvases and went door to door in, in Rego Park just to see with my own eyes how, um, how it's working, how we can refine the messaging, what the, the reception is. And the outreach effort is incredibly data driven. So every day we get a report, we have clearly defined routes that these canvassers have to go on. Um, we get um, number of doors knocked, number of um, people who actually answer the door because sometimes people aren't there and you just leave the, a flyer. And then we track the number of bin orders that we call like conversions, even though you don't have to use our brown bin in this program. We look at that as a really important piece of data that can tell us how our canvassing is going. And I'm really proud to say that to date, we have more bin, brown bin orders in Queens as part of this program than we had in the entire opt-in program. Um, and so I think that that is a sign that the outreach and the education campaign are working. Um, you also asked about the pause and why we're, we're pausing for the winter. What we've learned from other cities that have successfully rolled out curbside organics programs is that at the beginning in the startup phase, the leaf and the yard waste drive the tonnage. And the thought here is the leaf and yard waste in the fall when we're starting should be superb. And so we hope to get great tonnage just from having people put out their leaf and yard waste, something they already naturally separate. No fuss, no muss with leaf and yard waste. It's easy to do, it's not in your kitchen, it's, se it's separable, it's already separated. And then to pause in the winter when there is virtually no leaf and yard waste so that we avoid the problem of empty trucks in startup. That doesn't mean that every year we will stop for the winter, but I think that it would set the program off on the wrong foot if we ran not full trucks in the three winter months, which is why we're going to resume again in March after the winter pause. That's the rationale. I'm gonna turn, thank you for that. I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Osei. We'll come back to those, this program in a okay. little bit. Thank you. Uh, honestly, Council Member Botcher and Chair Nurse really did ask bulk of the questions that I wanted to ask you in terms of the reasoning for starting with Queens with this program. Um, I know we've had you know, a conversation outside of a hearing about the, the reasoning for that, and that's you know, to put good numbers on the board uh, so that there could be a potential expansion to the rest of the other boroughs. I mean, I know that you did uh, say that you may not have a timeline now, but um, when are you thinking uh, you'll be able to, to provide uh, that data um, and the success rate um, of this program in Queens uh, so that we can expect to see this in, in Brooklyn, Manhattan, the rest of the boroughs where a lot of our constituents are, are asking to see this type of program? Yeah, I can commit to providing you very clear data on, you know, certainly the first three months of the program before the pause this fiscal year, like without any doubt. 
Um, I want to be open and, and transparent about it because um, the council members can be our, uh, and have served as our real partners mm -hmm. in, in getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And then another question I want to ask with outreach and, you know, obviously we've heard about uh, some social media that, that is being done as well, some other things, um, and back to some of the data, you know, according to DSNY, 68% uh, of residential waste, 86% of school waste, and 55% of nitro waste uh, could be considered as organics or recycling, uh, yet they are sent to the landfills. Um, a question that I have in regards to outreach, most especially in NYCHA, I do represent a district with um, a decent amount of NYCHA uh, developments, um, is, is what has DSNY done to pr promote more outreach and education to ensure people are not throwing out their trash into landfills, most especially in NYCHA developments? And the reason I do ask that is because, you know, for social media, for example, um, if that's a means of, of doing outreach, some of our NYCHA developments and NYCHA residents uh, do not have Wi-Fi. Um, some don't have technology or smartphones where they're able to access social media. Um, and that's where sometimes we do see a large amount of waste uh, that is going to landfills um, just based off of how it's, it's, it's disposed. So um, what is the outreach most especially looking like within NYCHA developments um, in Brooklyn? Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson actually has overseen those outreach efforts, so I want to let her answer this question to give you a full picture of, of what's done and how it's done. Thank Nature. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Ose. Uh, so we've worked with, with Nitro for several years to roll out recycling. 2015 and 2016, we rolled out the public space recycling stations in every single Nitro development throughout the city. Um, and in, a, in, in, a, in addition to that, we had a mailer that went to every NYCHA resident that was translated. Um, we uh, ran a, a campaign around how to sort of crowdsource um, interested uh, groups, like uh, organizations within uh, each development to understand who might be motivated to help train the trainer, help be, teach their peers. A peer-to-peer -peer network seems to also be helpful. But um, as the commissioner mentioned, part of the challenge is creating the right convenience for recycling. So part of it is the flyers. We co-brand our recycling decals for NYCHA with NYCHA. We work very closely with NYCHA on that. But we are looking at how do we actually improve upon those recycling stations. That was an important first step, but we know it's not sufficient. So that access to bins is still very critical when it comes to NYCHA as well as the, the uh, communication. And, and just something to add, and I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I know, Commissioner, that you 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 came into this role uh, maybe towards the the summer. Um, so a lot of the resident association meetings were kind of um, ending. Um, as we start up again here in September, I'm definitely implore you all to to do some outreach at some of these resident associations. Would welcome you uh, to some of the resident association tenant association meetings within our district, so that um, you know they could hear from from the mouth of DSNY about some of the outreach that you are doing yourselves. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. That would be very valuable to me. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lose. I want to turn it to Councilmember Menon. Great. Thank you so much, Chair. So, Commissioner, good to see you. Um, one question I have is, have you looked at other cities in terms of recycling and diversion rates? Because if you look at, obviously, um, LA is at 76%, San Francisco is at 80% versus the abysmal 17% that we have. I think it would be great if we could get copies of the advertising and marketing and promotion and outreach that those cities are doing, because obviously what they're doing is working. And it makes me think about um, actually the census, because when I was running the census in 2020, I went back to look at the 2010 outreach census materials, because New York had a very poor abysmal rate in 2010, and it was actually about the messaging, because the messaging in the 2010 census was fill out the census, it's your civic duty. So I'm wondering if the messaging we're doing around recycling is about it's the right thing to do, which maybe is not motivational for a lot of people. You know, so I think we need to rethink the actual words on it. We need to rethink language access. We need to rethink how we're promoting this because clearly it's not working. So I think we need to learn from best practices from other cities. Um, I'm going to start with the, the messaging and then I'm going to ask the other Deputy Commissioner Anderson to talk to you about uh, the comparisons with, with other cities. Uh, I agree with you 100% on messaging. 
And this is something that we just lived and experienced through the, the organics rollout that, that's about to happen in Queens. I looked at the messaging for previous curbside organics programs and it was just TMI, too difficult, too complicated, you know, this isn't what, the only thing people are doing in their lives, like we just, we needed to make it much simpler, much more consumable and, and much easier for New Yorkers. And so we actually spent a huge amount of, of energy coming up with very simple, straightforward messaging around uh, composting. Um, we even in certain cases like stayed away from the word composting because it makes people feel like they have to create soil and whatever. It's like, no, no, just you, you separate out your leaf and yard waste already. Just like leave it out on a different day. I don't care what bin you put it in. Just give me your leaf and yard waste. Uh, I agree with you on the messaging around recycling, that that needs the same type of attention and care that we put into the organics messaging and that clearly you put into the, the census, the very successful census campaign that you led. Um, on other cities, clearly there is a lot to learn from other cities. Other cities do this differently from us in some respects, as I, I mentioned when I was answering previous questions, some respects they do it better. In some respects, it's been more problematic for them. But one point I really want to, to make clear is that the comparison rates you see between New York City and other cities on recycling rates are very much not apples to apples. And I would like for Deputy Commissioner Greg Anderson just to, just to describe that. Do you want this, Greg? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, for the question, Council Member. So I think there are a few key um, differences between New York City and other cities, not to say that we can't learn. I think there are some cities, particularly on the West Coast, that have been doing fantastic work in this space, have been real leaders. Um, the city of Portland, Oregon, for example, I think is, it probably has one of the best recycling systems in the country. They have separate collection for glass, for example, which actually really improves mm -hmm. the integrity of the, of the glass stream and the markability of that product. Um, but the, the key difference is one is, is data integrity. New York City stands alone at, as far as cities that actually publish legitimate data on how much we collect and where it goes. You look at Los Angeles, for example, they put out a report maybe five years ago, and since then there's been almost nothing on their diversion rate. Um, the same with San Francisco. There's uh, a lot of issues with measurement and who's measuring what against what baseline. Um, the state of California is, is doing work to try to improve that, and nationally there are some national organizations who are trying to um, create a sort of apples-to-apples -apples comparison that we can use, but right now it doesn't exist. Um, the second I would say is, you know, there are differences in, in the way these cities operate. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, the, the city diversion rate only includes what the city collects from single-family and two-to-four family homes doesn't include multifamily buildings, which you know have a lot of these challenges around what the building, how the building is set up, where the convenience of the recycling is. Okay, I, well, I guess it sort of begs a question. I mean, in terms of what we're doing here in New York, are you focus group testing your messaging? And are you doing that in multiple of different languages so you can actually get real world feel back, feedback? We have been focused on our organics, cur mm -hmm. curbside organics messaging, but I both take and agree with your point that we have to ap apply the same rigor and thoughtfulness to our messaging around recycling. And I look forward to working with you and working with Great. my team to do just that. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I also want to just add that the recycling rate in New York City is artificially low because we do not include or account for any of the recycling that happens as a result of the bottle bill, the existing bottle bill. So today, when New Yorkers collect those bottles and they bring them to the redemption centers, that material is not counted as part of our, the city's diversion rate, largely because um, those centers are not required to report tonnage. They are only required to report dollar value. 
And so I know that the bottle bill is being reconsidered and, and thought through uh, in the state. And one thing that I would urge and encourage as part of any amendment or change to the bottle bill is requiring reporting around tonnage, much like we do through, through our tonnage reporting on what's collected. I think that it will be provide a meaningful bump to the overall rate. Thank you, Commissioner. It was actually one of the questions we had was um, the support of our resolution for the state bottle bill and if you had uh, thoughts on that. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Council Member Farias. Thank you so much, Chair. I would love to also know if you support that, Frezzo, because I even think that data piece will give us better insight of where there's direct need or at least um, communities that are one, utilizing that, two, are in need of additional outside income, because that's one of the reasons why people are doing that, mostly in communities of color. So any insight on that would be super helpful. Um, I just have two, two quick things. Um, around the NYCHA conversation that Council Member Ose brought up, um, has DSNY considered looking at the NYCHAs that have green groups or green spaces with plot like plotters and different things to mobilize and start that education piece? I immediately think about Castle Hill Houses, uh, NYCHA development within my council district that has Grow NYC that I am proud to support on their on their campus and. Um, actively is promoting composting and working within the grounds because they have, you know, a group that's showing people from seed to vegetable, so on and so forth. And so have there been any efforts made around there with NYCHA developments and local CBOs? I'll start with the bottle bill part of the question and then I'll pass it over to Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson um, to go over the, the NYCHA piece of it. I think there's two big main points uh, to make on, on the proposed uh, bottle bill. The first I already went through, um, uh, which is that I'd love um, uh, there to be more report or reporting required on tonnage because I think that that would inform our diversion rate. And I think um, that that better data would be incredibly helpful. Um, to all of us, just as we think and, and, and strategize and long-term plan. The, the second piece that I haven't mentioned yet on the bottle bill is that if that change goes through as currently written, we, the city, would need to find all, an alternate funding stream for some of our curbside recycling. So as I explained earlier um, in our conversations, um, the material that we collect through curbside recycling gets sent to our, our partner facilities and then is ultimately sold or resold on like the com commodities markets. Mm -hmm. If you take out some of the value, the more valuable material, aluminum for example, and that goes into the the bottle bill and, and you take a lot of that out of our curbside program, then the total overall resale value for New York City Department of Sanitation curbside collected recyclables goes down. And that partially funds our recycling contracts. So um, we would just have to think through those budget implications. I mean, that's with the assumption that people are actually not gonna throw aluminum into the garbage, which. No, I, I agree Unfortunately, totally. I will say that, people that will still throw Canada dry into the regular garbage can. Aluminum <laughs> right. goes everywhere. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I just, I just wanted to raise those two items sure. for so, consideration. So that's explicitly written in the current state of the bill right now? In the, the bill as written. Okay. Correct, Greg? So something to consider. Um, great, thank you. And, and sorry, on the NYCHA. NYCHA, please. Yeah. 
Uh, so we've been talking about the Queen's Organics rollout, and we've been working very closely to ensure that every single nitro development in Queens it is uh, participating in separating organic material. So that is going to include on the campuses, there's a lot of leaf and yard waste, which is very exciting that we're going to get that onto the organics trucks. Um, and we are also leveraging the Smart Bin program, the expansion of the Smart Bin program, to have um, smart composting bins um, adjacent to um, some of the NYCHA campuses so that individuals can place material in the, bin, in the, in the bins. Um, we are also working on what can be done on the campuses. So not only are we looking to redesign the recycling stations, but also we have to add that extra stream, right? We want to make this normal and normalized um, within NYCHA developments as well as within um, Queens. So that is, that's been our area of focus right now, but we have a long history with our New York City Compost Project, working with the greening groups, the, the, the farm, the NYCHA farms, to make sure that compost application is, um, you know, you put your food scraps in the bin, you create the compost, and you apply the compost. That's something that we, we feel is a really important and impactful message. This is recycling happening in your, like, where you can watch it happen, and that's something you can't see with a plastic bottle. Sure. Thank you. And I just have a really quick one. Um, I, I recently went to shopping this weekend and I forgot my tote. I realized a store charged me 50 cents for a bag. And I looked back at the law and the law is, says at minimum 10 cents, not maximum. And so I'm wondering, does DSNY have any uh, data on complaints of different locations or businesses charging over a 10 cent fee? No, I did um, not. The bill is written at minimum, not maximum. DSNY, oh, DSNY does not enforce that because it's a okay. state bill. Got so it. that's state uh, DEC. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'll check in on that. Thank you, Council Member. Um, just to back up real quick to the bottle bill, um, what is the annual revenue stream that comes in from or that you would predict would be lost, and if, if you don't have it, it's okay, but that would be a follow-up. We can follow up with you on that, I apologize. Okay. It's not, I mean, what, it is? what about a percentage-wise of your revenue stream, about an estimate? We'll, we'll get it, we'll put together an estimate for you. Great, that would be great. Okay, um, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I wanna talk about plastic waste streams. So according to DSNY monthly waste tonnage reports, 48.2 million pounds of metal, glass, and plastic was collected just in the month of July 2022. Uh, much of it is going to Sims in Brooklyn. Um, when we were preparing for this hearing, one of the things we were just curious about was why are these numbers reported in aggregate um, as opposed to being broken out? Um, and then because we, we can't break them out, can you um, do you have any more recent annual data on the specific amount per stream, or is this something that only gets revealed or kind of estimated based on the, the waste characterization study? So to answer the first part of the question, it's really because of order of operation. So we collect the metal, glass, and plastic commingled, right? <laughs> Two streams, not five. Uh, and then when the truck shows up at the processing facility, it gets, it gets weighed on the truck commingled, and that's where our weights come from. That's why we don't have uh, a precise tonnage for plastic or for metal or for glass. Um, and then to answer the second part of your question, you're exactly right. Um, the next waste characterization study, which is already underway, we're doing our first, you know, digging through the bags next month, and we're doing three seasons of it that will really inform the, the most updated numbers on plastics. Okay, great. Um, okay, the waste, 2017 waste characterization study stated that the proportions of plastics in the MGP is 33.6% and noted a wide variety of types of plastics. The report listed 163 types of different plastics items ranging from plastic bottles to rigid plastic containers. How have the types of plastics, which we've been calling species based on an assembly member, this, how has the growth in the species of plastics over time challenged collection, sorting, processing, um, and the ability to recycle through our municipal and regional centers? 
All right, um, just to give you the historical landscape on this, um, if you compare the 2005 waste characterization study and then the 2017 um, study, uh, the, the weights associated with plastics in the waste stream went up from 14% to 15%. So it went up by one percentage point between those two waste characterization studies. Um, but what we can tell you is that there are more products and packaging certainly made from film and flexible plastic. These are not recyclable in our curbside program. They are also very light in weight. And so the, the pr proliferation in bags, sleeves, and wrappers is not reflected in the overall weight. Um, in addition, we're seeing more bulky, durable items like, for example, appliances or toys or housewares made of plastic as opposed to metal. Mm -hmm. um, these items are also not easy to recycle in our curbside program. Um, and the vast majority of rigid plastic bottles, containers, and single-use items are made from resin types that are considered valuable on the commodity market, but many are now made with additives, fillers, dyes, or adhesives um, that make it harder to reclaim the valuable resin for new manufacturing. That's generally the state of plastics in our recycling stream. Right, okay. Um, just a little bit more on the the kind of the work getting the work underway for the solid waste um, management plan and the ca characterization study. Um, so you've hired a staff person or you've hired a, a firm um, to start this. Do you can you give us an understanding of what their work plan is for the next year? Uh, Some of the big like benchmarks. Sure. Um, actually, Bridget is overseeing that, so she can provide you a lot of, of detail on it. Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, our new study, uh, which will be available early 2024, um, will have three seasons where we're collecting the data, and that's to understand any seasonal fluctuations and variations. In the past, yard waste has been the big, big one that obviously is much higher in the fall. Um, we are sampling um, residential, uh, NYCHA, schools, and for the, for the first time in over 20 years, we're actually sampling from litter baskets as well. Um, we have about almost 350 sorting categories that we're sorting the samples into. Um, and that's up from the last yeah, waste characterization additional, study. <laughs> um, probably driven by, you know, just what we think would be important related to new e-commerce items and things like that. Uh, so that's the basic landscape of the study. We're excited. We're getting it started. Um, and we look forward to having these new insights. We do think that e-commerce um, will be one of the, the big changes that we see in the waste stream. Um, can you just repeat, you said the, your, how many categories, how many buckets are you? Uh, 349 49. sort categories is what we currently have planned. And we start the sampling and the sorting next month in October. Um, this is like the deluxe version of waste characterization stuff. I was going to say, it's a big jump. <laughs> yes. um, is there any like highlights or like <laughs> specific categories that you want to, I mean, that makes my mind race to be like, what are we talking, like, what are these new buckets? So we look at uh, different material categories, so metal categories, plastic, organics, um, refuse, durable goods. We look at um, maybe construction demolition debris, uh, furniture, and then within uh, those categories, we look at, um, in detail, plastics, all the different types of plastics like we did last time. We look in detail at the product types, so to inform the bottle bill, how many types of bottles of different types of material are there to help us understand how much would be taken out of our waste stream, should the bottle bill expand, things like that. Great. And will the council be given a formal opportunity to review the draft plan um, before it's submitted to the state? The waste characterization yes. study? Yeah. No, the, the actual plan. Solid oh, the solid waste management plan. So the waste characterization study is going to inform the, plan. the solid waste management plan. Greg, do you know what the outreach process is? Yeah, so on the solid waste management plan, um, 
where we're currently at is doing the current conditions assessment portion. Um, and the, the solid waste management planning process has gotten much more formalized um, as a result of the state's uh, regulatory reform efforts over the last several years. So that current conditions assessment has to come first. That's what we're working on now. There's an extensive amount of public engagement with both the general public, elected officials, other stakeholders, and that will all happen over the course of the next three years before we get to even a draft plan that gets submitted to the city council, has to be approved under local law by the city council, and then submitted to DEC. Great. Um, I want to recognize council member Salamanca. I don't know if you have any questions. Just um, one more thing related to the waste characterization study. Will it track at all the companies or manufacturers of the products? No, just the type. Okay. Okay, um, plastic bags, um, the topic I hate the most. Um, in October 2020, New York State's plastic, ban took, uh, plastic bag ban took effect after years of waste advocates fighting to change our city's dependence on this unnecessary and destructive plastic. Since the implementation of the plastic bag ban, DSNY has seen a noticeable difference in the amount of plastic bag waste in the street litter, in street litter, waste transfer station, and or recycling facilities. And the question is, has DSNY seen a change? So um, as I mentioned before to your colleague, New York State DEC uh, is responsible to enforce the single-use plastic bag ban. Um, and so we won't really have a good answer, or good data um, to, to get at that question until we complete the waste characterization study. Probably have preliminary data after, like we don't have to do all three uh, seasons to get a preliminary answer to the question, but we'll really need to rely on the waste characterization study to answer that. Okay, um, and I guess I can also ask Sims what they're seeing. I guess I'm just curious if we're seeing a decrease at all. And then who, so who actually is enforcing the bag ban and is enforcement driven by 311 complaints? Are there spot checks? So the way it works is the state's Department of uh, Environmental Conservation began enforcing the law um, and the regulations on October 19th, 2020. Um, although we do not have enforcement jurisdiction, if a New York a New Yorker can call 311 and to put in a complaint, and those complaints are sent to New York State. DEC. So while we don't enforce, we do accept complaints and then pass them on to the entity that is doing the enforcement. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to, I know Councilmember Bacher had a follow up question. I'm sorry, I forgot. Go ahead. I just had a, a question about corner basket recycling. What's your position on the corner baskets that have recycling for paper and plastic? Over the years, I've been told that they've been pulled up because people aren't sorting the items properly. But isn't the answer, rather than pulling them up, to focus on the factors that are really causing people not to sort? Have we just given up on doing corner recycling? So um, the corner recycling litter, or the corner recycling baskets uh, work in some types of locations, but not in most types of locations. So where do they work? Um, in front of museums, in front of um, uh, certain ed types of educational facilities. Uh, but on the average normal street corner, when you go through them, they virtually mimic litter baskets, the, their contents. And so people use them interchangeably. And so our plan or our, our strategy now is to use them where they work and take them away from where they don't work. Because when they don't work, they're just like a complete drain on, on resources and the, and the material ends up is so contaminated that it can't be recycled. Kind of disappointing though, isn't it, that people won't Sort their recycling. On it's the disappointing, corner. but it's realistic. You have a goal of one day having a city where you could put recycling on every corner and people will actually do it. Is that a goal? I, as the sanitation commissioner, that is absolutely the, the dream. Um, I just, 
I don't want to promise New Yorkers something that I can't see today a path to being realistic. That doesn't mean we won't keep pushing and, and driving, but as far as the city's recycling efforts, I don't think that they are well placed in increasing the number today of uh, corner recycling baskets. I think that'd be a great goal during your tenure to expand these locations and that would be a reflection of the positive efforts that you're making if, if we're able to do that. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Botcher. I think we all want that dream city. I don't know if we'll get there though. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about paper and cardboard. Um, over the past few years, uh, especially during being sheltering in place and just an increase in delivery-based services such as Amazon, New York City has seen a major increase in packaging plastics and cardboard waste. And this increased waste, as you mentioned earlier, is just an, a new factor and a new element, um, particularly as a barrier on the pathway to zero waste. Um, so with the rise in e-commerce and online consumerism, there is more cardboard, and how, how is DSNY adapting to the change in materials that are being generated? So let's first go over the numbers. Um, cardboard between the 2005 Waste Characterization Study and the 2017 Waste Characterization Study went from 3.1% to 5.7% of the waste stream. If you compare that to newspapers, for example, those went from 7.5% down to 1.9%. Um, the big, there are a number of implications of the increase in cardboard. And, and by the way, we totally expect that in this forthcoming waste characterization study to see even more cardboard beyond the 5.7% from, from 2017. So the, the, the big overall challenge with the increase in cardboard is volume. <laughs> Lots of problems associated with the volume of cardboard. First, obviously storing it in buildings. We talked about um, the, building foot, the building footprints for waste and recyclables already aren't generally or often not are not sufficient um, to meet recycling needs. So volume in terms of like storage in buildings is a big concern. It also takes up a lot of space on the curb. I mean, people are used to walking by, you know, piles of trash, but then like even larger piles sometimes of cardboard set out right next to it. Um, and then like in terms of our operations, because the cardboard is bulkier, as it, as it grows and as the percentage it makes up of the waste stream grows, the number of barge trips we need to uh, take to transport it all to our processing facilities goes, goes up. Those are some of the implications of the increase in cardboard um, that we see in our waste stream. Um, but, but to be clear, the cardboard, like all the paper, goes to Pratt. Um, it goes to the Pratt's mill um, on Staten Island. Um, it's delivered there by barge, by truck, whatever it is. Okay, great. Um, and I have a question actually from our council member, Jim Gennaro, who had to hop off. Um, he was our chair of the Department of Environmental Protection, but was very, very adamant that I ask. Um, so the question is, are there, is, will there be, for, I guess, I'm guess, I'm guessing he's referring to Queens, will there be an additional truck added to handle organic waste, or will the organics be collected by existing trucks already on the street? And, you know, his concern is that additional trucks leads to more uh, emissions. Uh, organics collection is great, but minimizing additional trucks is also good, um, and that's usually not always considered. Um, you know, DS, his concern is Department of Sanitation needs to minimize this with the two bin trucks. So I'm just curious, or he's curious, um, if you'll be adding additional trucks. That's what we're doing. Um, we said, I said earlier that it was the cheapest 
uh, curbside organics program rolled out, um, we have achieved that, uh, among other things, through fleet efficiencies and leveraging more dual bin trucks to support the program. So we're on the same page. So I'm, I'm sorry, for the dual bin that's being used for the organics, it's just, it's recyclables and organics or it's leaf and organics? How, what's the dual part specifically? No, no, the, the dual meaning organics goes all together, whether it's food waste mm -hmm. or um, yard waste. Okay, and then in the other side? The other side is, is, is the, yeah, is the refuse. Landfill trash. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, in, not, not in every part of Queens. In, so, in some parts of Queens okay. that doesn't work, but in, okay. in parts of Queens where the refuse numbers allow for it, we are leveraging dual bin trucks. We're also creating additional routing efficiencies as well. So for this couple month project uh, or the, the pilot for there Queens? There will be more dual bin trucks. Out, out additional yes. ones. Okay. Yes. Do you know but how not many? Every, not every organics collection route will be a dual bin truck because right. some routes can't accommodate it because the amount of right. refuse is so large. And would you be able to follow up with us on how many additional? Oh, yeah, we have all the numbers. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Uh, question We didn't have much to ask about metals, so we just had a basic questions. Uh, what are some recent shifts and challenges in the metal waste stream? Um, Greg or Bridget, do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so uh, aluminum is the highest value item we have in our recycling stream. Um, but anecdotally, we see that many aluminum products are actually lighter weight than they used to be. That's, um, and metal recycling is, is heavily impacted by scavenging. So when the value of metal is high, scavenging is higher. When the value of metal is low, we get more material on our trucks. Uh, those are, those are two highlights around metal. Thank you. Okay, I only have two more categories and then we can open it up. So ideally you'll be off the hook pretty soon, right within time. Um, one of the questions we had was on litter and recyclables. New York City implements a variety of programs to intercept trash and debris before it becomes waterborne. So when it rains, trash and debris on the street can end up in the city's catch basins. From there, the trash and debris can make, it way, make its way into the sewer system and sometimes all the way to our waterways. So when recyclable materials are recovered outside of just the standard residential collection or the standard waste stream by city agencies, from whether it's from clogged catch basins, floating booms, beaches, are these discarded as trash or routed to proper recycling streams? I, um, I hesitate to speak definitively for the Department of Environmental Protection, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, that this, th those materials are discarded as, as trash. And just keep in mind that materials that have traveled through the sewer system <laughs> and that are <laughs> collected from the harbor or beaches are likely to be contaminated with other materials, making them not good candidates for recycling um, or incompatible with, with our, our recycling, which is why um, they are uh, discarded as trash. And do you, do you all collaborate with DP around this? Um, Greg, do you have? Around that litter specifically or, or reducing litter on our streets? No, when it's recovered from DEP. Is there any collaboration at all from what DEP is collecting on beaches and things like that to see what's what can be recycled and what isn't, or is it just mostly going straight into the landfill stream? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very small share of the overall waste stream, but I think it's an opportunity and, and we're certainly happy to reach out to them and, okay. and have those conversations. Okay, um, I, I had one question that I forgot to ask around some of the barriers that you presented earlier. You specifically talked about design and space in these buildings. I know there is legislation for new buildings around having solid, solid waste management plans in their design, but for older buildings that are gonna continue to be chronic, chronically challenged, um, is DSNY working with Department of Buildings to address some of those concerns? Has there been any initial conversations or collaborations around that? Greg can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the answer is no. And I, well, Greg, am I, is that correct? Okay. 
I think the answer is no, and I think the, the reason why is, I mean, you can't really make space. Um, and so much is like squeezed into um, some of these buildings that really the best opportunity is when there is a new building being constructed or a significant meaningful change to the building, which is when um, this kicks in. Okay. Okay, my last uh, set of questions is around e-waste and specifically e-bike batteries. Um, it's come up quite a bit. There's a lot of effort by council members um, to create legislation around this and try to come up with some solutions, um, particularly in relationship to some fires and hazardous incidents that have happened. So um, I know that you gave us information on the amount of money that the Department of Sanitation is collecting with battery or expending on battery disposal. I have 108,000 for FY 2022 and 256,000 for FY 2023. Um, but I guess to, to kind of dig in more, how does DSMI currently handle rechargeable batteries? Um, let me just describe generally our battery collection efforts. Um, so batteries are generally brought to us through either our uh, safe disposal events or our special waste drop-off sites. So New Yorkers, if they have rechargeable batteries or frankly any type of battery, can bring those batteries to us at uh, either those uh, events or those sites. Um, we also have information on our website about a program uh, called Call to Recycle that offers mail back um, and has a map of the drop-off options for rechargeable batteries. Um, that program, Call to Recycle, is paid for by the state's rechargeable battery law. Um, that's generally how we handle and manage batteries. I, I don't wanna neglect to mention we're doing a small pilot on Staten Island where we're piloting uh, curbside pickup by appointment of batteries. Um, but, but generally, the point is like the e-mobility batteries, they represent a growing share of the waste stream. The numbers are expected to triple by 2025. They are incredibly dangerous if they're handled improperly. Um, sadly, they have, as you know, been involved in a growing number of fires, including fires that have caused serious injury and death. Um, we have a response capability, meaning when an incident occurs at a residence, um, as opposed to a commercial facility, DSNY works with the FDNY in, in the response to those, those incidents. That's generally our role. It's like mostly collection and then response with FDNY when it's a resident to a residential incident. Does DSNY track at all any data on e-bike batteries? Um, we don't have the definitive data on it. I mean, I can read off some, some statistics about our response to incidents, but we at DSNY don't have any type of definitive data about like the number of rechargeable batteries out there. Um, and one thing that I've, I've learned recently is even in the batteries that we collect, for example, at our safe, uh, safe disposal and uh, other types of, of events, uh, our special waste drop-off sites, we don't track the number precisely of rechargeable batteries that we get. We just track the overall number of batteries. So I think that that's an opportunity uh, to improve. But in terms of like the incidents we respond to at residences, it's going up every every quarter. Okay, great. Um, and so I imagine then similarly, I, I asked that overall because we did have a question of if DSNY was tracking, you know, who's selling these batteries or have any inventory of who, you know, what's being sold here and purchased and used here in New York City. But we got it. Okay. Um, I actually 
forgot I had a section on commercial waste, but this morning there was a hearing on uh, for the Committee of Mental Health and one of the bills being discussed has to deal with syringe needles um, and a collection program around it. And there was some questions about who's actually responsible for handling syringe needles right now. So I have a question about, uh, it, it was alluded that sanitation has a small department in there, but I wasn't sure, so I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. And then I think I saw a syringe at the Sims and the educational thing, but I couldn't remember if I saw it as recyclable or not recyclable, so I was curious about that as well. Uh, we, we definitely play a role in the collection of syringes. We do have teams that are specially trained that do that work. Uh, sadly, I get uh, alerts almost daily, certainly weekly, about sanitation workers being, you know, doing their job, doing their collection, being pricked by a syringe that's improperly disposed of in the trash that is unacceptable and it, it creates a real hazard and, and danger to our workforce. Um, Greg, is there anything you wanna add to that? I'll just add that, that there are safe ways to dispose of syringes. Um, so there are take back programs at pharmacies and things like that. You can also, um, you can throw them away if you put them in, you know, if you have a laundry detergent bottle or something like that, you can put them in, tightly seal the lid and just put right, right on their syringes. That's a safe way to get rid of these products and that way, you know, you're not throwing them loosely into a litter basket or a, a trash bag or something like that where they could hurt someone. And are they recyclable? They are not recyclable. Not. Great, okay, I have just a few questions on commercial waste recycling and then, I, and then I'm really turning it over for testimony. I forgot I had this whole section. Okay, so New York City's commercial recycling rate from private businesses has been much lower than in leading cities like San Francisco or Seattle, maybe. I know you alluded to some of the metrics around that being questionable. In some of the city's private sector transfer stations and recycling facilities, there is a troubling decline in the amount of material recycled in recent years as reported to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. A continued low commercial recycling rate will undermine one of the major goals of the new commercial waste zone system being implemented next year. So how will DSNY track recycling and waste reduction within the new system? And are there plans to rapidly increase the amounts of waste recycled and composted from private businesses? So I think the answer to that is that um, with commercial waste zones, we will finally be able to track recycling and waste reduction um, in, in the commercial world. Um, as we discussed before, currently businesses in New York City are required to recycle. Um, but the Carters are not required to provide recycling service to their customers. And additionally, the other problem with the, the current state of affairs is that the data collection on, uh, the data on recycling collection in the, in the commercial world is very poor. The commercial waste zones will address both of those things um, by requiring um, detailed reporting and requiring carters to provide both recycling and organic services at lower cost than refuse. Great, and will DSNY publish that information on the disposal, recycling, and composting rates for private haulers yep. under the new system? Well, we're gonna publish it, um, we're gonna publish regular reports on diversion rates by geography and by carter as part of um, the reporting requirements under the commercial waste zones. Okay, and I know there's capacity at SIMS, but is any of that going to be made available for the commercial uh, sector? So under the city's contract with SIMS, they are able, um, they, they may accept commercial recyclables in either their Brooklyn or their Jersey City facilities. Um, so so they, they can if they have the capacity to do it. Okay. Um, and then for enforcement, I know enforcement was pretty much not happening under the pandemic, um, but what did, how do you anticipate um, capacity for enforcement as this takes effect? So, uh, you know, for the new composting recycling rules for business and private haulers, 
Um, do you have adequate budget and staff for both enforcement? I know we've talked about this a little bit before in our budgetary hearings, but it'd be a great refresher. And also around uh, customer education, education for the small businesses, around what they are supposed to be doing. Um, let, let's start with education, because generally education becomes before, before enforcement, or at least in, in this, the, the way that this is being rolled out, education is um, happening first. So we have a dedicated staff for outreach specifically for the commercial waste zone rollout, and so that team has been assembled in advance of the commercial waste zone impl uh, implementation, and we're going to ramp up our outreach efforts as we get closer to uh, the first customer transition period, which will happen next year. Um, over the summer, these outreach staff have been working on commercial recycling and organics outreach, just because they're, they're hired, they're available. Um, and they've been spending their summer reminding businesses of the requirements and offering information about how to comply. So we do have a dedicated outreach team. On enforcement, enforcement uh, for commercial waste zones will be conducted by the same group of sanitation police and enforcement agents that enforce other cleaning and recycling laws. Um, we are working with our colleagues at OMB to ensure that we have adequate resources to match the, the enforcement challenge that the Commercial Waste Zone Program will represent. Okay, so for the outreach team specifically, how many people is that? Uh, oh, for, for this yeah, piece for commercial recycling? It's nine. Nine? And these folks speak a variety of languages? How, do they all, how many languages do they speak? Uh, I don't have that with me today. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'd love but to follow up that. on yeah. that. Yeah. And then for enforcement, how many people do you have now, and how many people would you like to grow into? Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but we can definitely follow up with you on the numbers we have for sanitation, police, and enforcement agents. Okay. Okay. I think that's all my questions. It's like seven pages of questions. Um, I think we're going to turn it over to public testimony now. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, so for folks who want to testify, um, I'm going to announce a handful of folks in a row. Okay, okay. Thank you, DSNY. Thank you for all your answers. Thank you for sharing. We're looking forward to the follow-up with you all. Um, the first panelist is gonna be Tom Outerbridge. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're gonna give you about five minutes and then I do have some questions specific to you, to your operation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Nurse and members of the committee, sanitation committee. Um, my name is Tom Atterbridge. I'm the president of Sims Municipal Recycling or SMR. As the commissioner mentioned, we uh, receive and process 100% of the metal, glass and plastic collected by the Department of Sanitation across the city and about half of the paper. I think to shorten the time my remarks I'll sort of um, <clears throat> leave out some background uh, points which I think were raised to, uh, to a large extent in terms of the current capture rate in the city of metal glass plastic and what we know is still going into the trash at least based on the, the last composition study I mean the good news is uh, a little more than 50 percent of what is designated as metal glass and plastic recyclable is actually making its way into the bin um, and that's due to a lot of effort uh, on a lot of people's part. Uh, the bad news is a little less than 50% is still going into the trash. I think a lot of us got into this recycling activity because of the environmental benefit, but I think given some pending fiscal challenges that the city's facing, it's worth noting the financial impacts of this. Somewhere in the order of a half a million tons a year of 
metal, glass, plastic, and paper going into the trash at significantly higher cost than uh, were to be directed into the recycling program. Um, I can leave it to sanitation to sort of put a, put a dollar amount to that, but um, it's, it's a meaningful number in terms of the, the budget to the city. Uh, the other thing that I would, um, I think there was some good questions about what is it going to take for New York City residents to do this, and I'm not an expert in this, but I think we probably have all seen examples of through social media and other methods, <coughs> people being persuaded to do a lot more difficult, less convenient, and sometimes less productive things than recycling properly. So I wouldn't give up on, uh, on getting New Yorkers to do the right thing. Acknowledging, I think, as the commissioner mentioned, specific challenges in, challenges in New York City with high density housing, small apartments, and NYCHA with also very limited infrastructure. The other thing from our standpoint is on the participation front is getting people to not put things in the bin that don't belong there. This also has fiscal implications. When this, we see more and more paper in the MGP bin, particularly since the pandemic, um, because I think of all the cardboard people have been receiving at home through, uh, through e-commerce. And when somebody puts paper in the, in the MGP bin, it costs the city more money than when they put it in the, the proper paper bin. It also doesn't help us. Uh, it's very difficult for us to process and recover that paper. Textiles, perhaps not so much on the financial side for the city, but environmentally, there's many, many options to recycle textiles across the city, from citywide drop-offs to local goodwills. If it comes to us, which it does uh, quite frequently, it will end up in the landfill. Um, the last uh, contaminant that I would bring up which is not such a great, great issue in terms of volume, but is it our, probably our biggest hazard is, is uh, lithium ion and, and other rechargeable batteries. And that's, so if my first point is public participation, my second point is really uh, what can be done about lithium ion batteries. Um, you've probably seen news, I heard another news story yesterday, I think of a child that may have died in Queens over the weekend due to a scooter battery. Um, I've attached to my testimony some additional facts and figures that we've put together, but there are literally hundreds of fires a year occurring at our facilities in the back of the backs of Department of Sanitation collection trucks at other recycling and waste management facilities <coughs> and in apartment buildings across the city. Um, I raised this to the Sanitation Committee, but I think you have other um, sort of uh, sister committees across the the city council that where this will be a relevant topic, whether that be um, fire and emergency management, consumer um, and worker protection, environmental protection, and public safety. Um, I we deal with it as recyclers and people in the waste management business, but I think that it's valuable to look at this outside of the recycling context and really look at it as a as a public safety issue. Unfortunately, there are going to be more injuries and destruction of property um, before we get this issue under control. Lithium ion battery use is projected to increase, I think, 300% by 2025, and bike battery fires in New York City are on track to double in 2022. But we aren't helpless in this situation. Washington, D.C. in 2021 passed a fairly aggressive rechargeable battery law. California just passed two laws. Um, we're working with different uh, groups from across the state, public and private, to draft the elements of a strong bill that could be enacted either at the state level or the city level. I personally think the city can act quite a lot faster than the state, and this is an issue that requires fast action. We do need state cooperation uh, based on the 2010 state law that specifically preempts local jurisdictions from passing laws on rechargeable batteries. Um, so we hope that you will work with your counterparts in the assembly in, in Albany to eliminate that preemption language and proceed with a law here in New York City. The last issue I would just bring up is extended producer responsibility for packaging. This is state level legislation, um, but last year the council issued a resolution in support of a bill that was uh, being proposed in Albany. It didn't pass. Um, but coming from the city of New York, that means a lot. The, obviously, the largest city in the state. And um, we expect this issue to come up again this year. 
and we hope that you will be um, supportive and involved in that. Um, for those who aren't familiar with packaging EPR, um, basically it has two critical variables that I would bring up here. One is it incentivizes producers of packaging to reduce, eliminate, or where they can't do that, make sure that the packaging they put on the marketplace is recyclable. And secondly, it would reimburse New York City for much or all of its recycling program costs, which I think last year the Department of Sanitation estimated to be in excess of $100 million a year. So these are, um, a num by the way, Maine and uh, Oregon passed EPR laws a couple of years ago. California and Colorado did it last year. This is not brand new territory. Um, so I think New York can, um, it's time certainly for New York to uh, catch up here. Um, anyway, I think there's a number of issues between this participation and so forth that are both in the battery issue have significant financial implications for the city, not to mention the health and health and welfare issue associated with, with batteries. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Take Thank any you questions. Tom. I, I did have just a couple questions that it seemed like sanitation didn't have answers to me because they're just not on the ground at where you are. So I had a question about the plastic bags and since the ban took effect, if you had seen any, you know, arguable, any, have you seen any increase or de decrease? Have you seen any changes in it? I know that the enforcement of it hasn't been over the last couple of years. Now it's coming back into play. Not really clear if they have the capacity for real enforcement or who's, who's actually doing it. So just kind of seeing from your point of view on the ground what you're seeing. I would not say at this point I can point out a measurable difference in what we're seeing. It's not to say it's not happening, um, but not at sort of a level that we would be measuring it or capturing it in, 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 in reduced tonnage of plastic bags. Right, and could you describe how plastic bags um, present challenges for your facility or not? Yeah, so plastic bags are, look, we acknowledge that plastic bags are, are part of the way New York cities are, New, York, New Yorkers are, are allowed to put recyclables out on the street, just given the nature of the city and the density. Um, and we built our plants to, to open up those large bags. The problem that we have is bags inside of bags inside of bags, or, you know, some people don't read the public education literature and they think plastic is plastic and we get plastic curtains and tarpaulins and um, bags jam-packed full of other bags. And so, um, A, they don't have a market, so they end up as going to landfill, which is a cost, but B, they get entangled. They get entangled in other things we actually want to recycle. We have markets for coat hangers, classic example. Uh, they get tangled in shafts and screening equipment, so we spend a lot of time and effort extracting plastic bags from the stuff we want just to then turn around and send it to a landfill. All right. Um, and then I did have a question about bioplastics. Have you been seeing bioplastics, those kind of like green, quote unquote, biodegradable bags coming into your facility or bio, you know, com compostable cutlery, things like that? So the way we sort plastics with, is with optical sorters rather than manually, and optical sorters use near-infrared light to detect plastic by resin type. So fortunately, we're not relying on a human being to de determine whether a plate or a bowl is polypropylene or bioplastic. The optical sorter does that. So if it is a bioplastic, it will end up in our residue, unless it's some plastics, bioplastics are designed to mimic um, petroleum-based plastics, and those would end up in our plastic. But we have not had complaints from our customers for our assorted plastics. Um, and on the plastic, the, the, the plastic cutlery would not be recovered in either case. Okay. I had a question about uh, the capacity at Sims. It seems like you all have capacity. Have you all, do you all currently have any commercial waste or private carters that tip at your facility? Um, and if not, would, would you be open to it? Have you explored it in the past? So we have explored it. We've received test loads from different haulers who I think some of them also leading up it to uh, the waste zone bids to sort of uh, see what quality of material they would collect. 
right now and on a regular basis, we're um, only very sporadically as there a private hauler who has a load of material that wants to come to us. So today, on a regular basis, no, very little to minimal. Um, we do have excess, some excess capacity. Obviously, Department of Sanitation gets priority for that capacity, and so we have to reserve some of that for surges that occur, you know, typical seasonal surges in, in the city co residential collections. Um, but, um, yeah, we have told private haulers who are bidding in the commercial zone, should they win, should their material be of a quality that we can accept and process and market, and should we have capacity, we would be open to uh, taking that material. Okay. Thank you so much. Those are the only questions I had. Thank you for the tour. That was my second time there. I learned so much more the second time around. I really appreciate what you and your team, um, you know, that you spent the time really going over the operations with us and answering all our questions. So thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, I hope you use this as a resource as much as is useful. Thank you. Um, so the next panel we're going to call is uh, Lacey Tober. Tober on behalf of Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Um, we'll have Eric Goldstein and Oliver Wright representing all of the swabs. Um, and then in the next panel, we will, um, I'm gonna allow, yes, yes. In the next panel, we'll, we'll invite um, some of the workers here to give testimony. Or a third person. Oh, Oliver. So Lacey, you're first. Oh, okay. Wasn't sure if you were ready. All right. Um, hi, my name is Lacey Tauber. I'm here on behalf of Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing today on this important issue. Um, I'm going to skip over the part of the testimony that has all the stats. I think we've uh, gone over that sufficiently today and just focus um, on some of the solutions, um, including intro 494, which will help us find the right policies that will really work um, for our city. But in addition to those, I um, wanted to just put forward some more ideas um, for how to really um, address the fact that we are falling short on our diversion rate um, here in New York City. Um, the first is to pass intro 559, also known as the skip the stuff bill, which would create an opt-in mechanism for single-use plastic utensils, napkins, and condiments from restaurants, uh, food delivery apps, and online delivery platforms. Um, so many of these items are immediately thrown away, especially when people can eat at home. Um, and uh, we hope to see that bill get a hearing in the Committee on Consumer and Worker Protection soon. Um, enforcement of the plastic bag ban, which was discussed a lot today. Um, the borough president was a real champion of ridding our city of plastic bags when he was chair of the sanitation committee. And you know, we're um, dismayed to find that uh, limited education and enforcement efforts have kind of hampered the implementation, um, especially with smaller businesses where cost is a concern. would really like to see um, the city continue to do outreach and education, including giving away reusable bags. Um, prioritizing recycling and the implementation of commercial waste zones. So the borough president was concerned to learn that before the R RFP responses were finalized, DSNY implemented um, a change to the requirements, giving more flex flexibility to the pricing differential between recycling and refuse. And um, we're hopeful that this hasn't uh, disincentivized respondents from submitting robust waste diversion plans and encouraged DSNY to place a high priority on proposals that will push our commercial recycling efforts forward. Um, passing the zero waste bills, uh, which we also talked about a lot, interest 274 and 275 on the zero waste goals, 280 on community recycling centers, 244 um, universal curbside organics collection. Uh, the BP was pleased to see the recent expansion into Queens, or the planned expansion, I should say, but we're going to continue to push until we have the citywide mandatory program year round. And then on the state level, as we talked about a little bit today, um, policies for extended producer responsibility and a better bottle bill. Um, we were looking at you know, a country like Germany that has you know, a 70% uh, 
uh, countrywide diversion rate and why is it so good? One of the reasons is that they have really strong regulations um, for EPR in place since 1991. And um, we'd like to see a better bottle bill that expands the type of beverage containers covered and increases the deposit amount. Um, so these are just a few ideas um, that the borough president supports and we look forward to working with you on and uh, always happy to be here with Eric and, uh, and our Brooklyn Swap. Thank you, Lacey. Um, thank you very much for always coming to our hearings um, and representing the former sanitation chair. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Eric Goldstein from National Resources Defense Council. Thank you, thank you, Chair Nurse, and good afternoon to you and the distinguished staff present. Uh, I'm Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're pleased to be here today to testify at this important hearing and to support Intro 494, which as you know would require DSNY in consultation with other agencies to conduct a study, comprehensive study, to identify ways of reducing fossil fuel-based impossible to recycle single-use plastics. In 1989, the council passed landmark legislation to jumpstart citywide recycling in the nation's largest city. The law required the Department of Sanitation to designate materials New Yorkers had to separate to collect those materials at curbside and to ensure that at the end of the fifth year, the department was collecting at least 25% of the city's residential and institutional trash for recycling. The law also included provisions mandating recycling of commercial waste collected by private carters. The then city council speaker, Peter Vallone, called the recycling bill, quote, one of the most significant pieces of legislation in the history of the city, unquote. And then Mayor Koch's sanitation commissioner, Brendan Sexton, who ultimately supported passage of the law, told the New York Times, quote, we're going to recycle like crazy, unquote. Things haven't quite worked out that way. For years, budget cuts, rule changes, suspension of recycling connections, ineffective public education efforts, variations in enforcement, uh, and other factors have confused residents and dampened participation. As a result of these factors and often tepid city hall support for the program, recycling levels did not grow even to the modestly envisioned statutory targets. And even today, almost uh, more than three decades later, uh, the, the goals of the 89 recycling statute have not been achieved. The residential rate remains under 20%. According to the latest mayor's management report, the, ratio, the, the rate actually fell in FY22 from 18 to 17%. And of course, as the commissioner notes, that doesn't include bottle bill material, so the actual rate is a little higher. That's not nothing, that number, and we thank the Department of Sanitation men and women for their good work, and we can be proud of the operations of Sims Recycling in Sunset Park and the Pratt Industries Paper Recycling Facility on Staten Island. But we're nowhere near maximizing the potential of these sensible strategies. Some say, who cares? What if we don't maximize recycling? Well, again, very quickly, for one thing, the city's failure to meet these modest recycling goals means that 30 years after the passage of Local Law 19, the overwhelming bulk of the city's trash is exported to landfills, the third largest source of climate-destroying methane emissions in the United States, and incinerator is a major localized source of air pollutants. Making matters worse, both landfills and incinerators are often cited in black and brown communities. Second, the economic impacts of this export policy are detrimental to city taxpayers. Tipping fees at these landfills and incinerators have increased over time. The city is now paying nearly a half a billion dollars a year to export waste. And finally, by exporting waste and not building up recycling and composting operations in the city, we're missing out on the opportunity to, to provide good blue collar jobs for New Yorkers. Here are six steps. I'll just summarize them and set them forth in our written uh, testimony that the council and the city can and should take to improve on all that's been accomplished and to grow the recycling program. First, and most importantly, enact the universal curbside composting legislation. Food scraps and, lar and yard waste are the largest portion. This bulk, uh, the bulk of this material is sent to incinerators and landfills. Intro 244, as you well know, now has 41 co-sponsors. Uh, as for commercial waste, the recently passed commercial waste zone law provides a vehicle for the department to consider uh, commitments to composting when it uh, awards the zone contracts 
We are concerned about the Queen's curbside experiment, although we're pleased the administration is moving forward and it's well intended, but we worry about the level of public education. We are concerned about the distribution of bins. We're concerned about the planned winter suspension. We need the council to intervene and pass intro 244. Uh, four other quick things to mention in terms of waste prevention. Intro 559, the skip the stuff bill. Waste prevention is at the, the top of the state's hierarchy and the skip the stuff bill, which now has 21, 27 co-sponsors, ought to be next on the list. Third, ensure full school system and NYCHA compliance with local law 19. Uh, we're pleased to hear that the administration is committed to expanding school system recycling in every school by 2023. We hope that includes a commitment um, to uh, not only composting, but to recycling as well, and to making every school a recycling champion. That's gonna require funding from the council for Grow NYC's operation. As for NYCHA, your last hearing focused on these problems. Uh, while NYCHA management faces many problems, they're the city's largest landlord, much more is needed there. Uh, improved public recycling education efforts also has been talked about. We agree with Council Member Menon's suggestion on the messaging. Apple, Google, Ford, Toyota, they're very well-known, well-established brands, but every year they spend tens of millions of dollars to build brand awareness and educate the public in very sophisticated ways about the benefits of their products. We need a more comprehensive, consistent, effective DSNY public education program to give New Yorkers the information they need on recycling. Uh, stepped up enforcement, it's great when you pass laws, but if you don't enforce them, you don't achieve the statutory and the council objective. According to the mayor's recent management report, the number of summonses for recycling violations has declined from 84,000 in FY18 to just over 32,000 in FY22. Obviously, we understand the pandemic had something to do with that, uh, but uh, we really need to step up enforcement. And then finally, intro 494, figuring out the next steps for reducing the ever-growing amount of fossil fuel-based throwaway plastics who could possibly oppose that legislation? Uh, we uh, don't think that the council or the department should do anything to get behind state legislation to support so-called chemical or advanced recycling, which is neither advanced nor recycling. And we appreciate your attention. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that um, there were a couple of questions I had related to your testimony that we weren't able to get. So the questions we'll be following up with um, were about you know, how many bins are going to multi-story buildings with the new pilot. I'm looking at you all, I know we can't drag you back up, but, um, and you know, if people aren't putting it out in the bin, if they didn't collect a bin, what is it going in? Is it just a clear bag? Um, will you still collect it and how many days? I know that those were questions that we had talked about earlier. So we'll, we'll request that in the follow-up. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from um, Oliver. Oliver Wright, representing the Slavs. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Nurse and members of the Sanitation Committee. My name is Oliver Wright, and I'm pleased to provide this testimony on behalf of the Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Bronx Solid Waste Advisory Boards. I also wanted to thank Commissioner Tish and Deputy Commissioners Anderson and Anderson and uh, acknowledge that some of the topics in this testimony have been discussed to some extent. The city's recycling program should always be considered holistically within a much broader landscape of waste, environmental quality, public health and environmental justice issues. As the Department of Sanitation gears up to prepare the 2026 Solid Waste Management Plan, now is an appropriate time to consider the role of recycling within the city's wider goals. I'll skip over the, the stats as we've covered them a lot, um, but there are multiple reasons for the current underperformance of recycling that we recommend be addressed as follows. Firstly, New York City doesn't spend enough on recycling, outreach, and education, currently spending only 86 cents per person per year by our estimates. Local composting programs would create local green jobs, educate the public, reduce truck miles, and improve green spaces. So a combination of drop-off sites, local processing facilities, community gardens, and micro haulers would have a visibly transformative effect. A properly resourced organics program should also contain a food waste reduction education and outreach program at the top of the waste hierarchy. 
Strong EPR legislation at state level could substantially increase recycling rates by rationalizing packaging. As touched upon by Commissioner Tish, materials covered in New York City under the bottle bill should also be included in our citywide recycling recovery statistics. As it stands, we're under-reporting our recovery rates. Um, curbside collection currently places recyclables and organic collection at a disadvantage to landfill. Many neighborhoods continue to receive three weekly trash pickups compared to only one for recycling. This makes recycling less convenient than trash. A simple reallocation of resources would allow for recycling to be placed on an equal footing with garbage and set the tone for higher diversion rates. In terms of NYCHA, NYCHA's residents are not adequately included in the city's recycling efforts, and so we're lacking the participation of 340,000 residents. Passing a universal mandatory curbside organics collection would be essential to recovering that additional 34% of the residential waste stream that represents organic material. We recommend that this legislation make the program mandatory wherever it's currently offered. Touching upon the upcoming Queen's Organics rollout, we must learn from previous mistakes. Commissioner Tish stated in the hearing of June the 15th, that the next time we roll out a curbside organics program should be the last. We must get it right this time. The current surprise extension of curbside organics collection for the entire borough of Queens, it must not stop and start. Participation must be mand mandatory. An adequate number of bins must be made available to residents in multifamily buildings, and there must be investment in education and outreach for this new and challenging behavior change. The program risks being another expensive failure by not only repeating but expanding upon previous mistakes, posing a fatal blow to any hopes of success for this program in the future. Just got a couple more quick points. Um, the zero waste legislative package introduced in May should be passed and adequately resourced so that it can be integrated with the SWAMP, the state's Climate Action Plan and the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, among others. And finally, we're also supportive of Intro 19, uh, 494, which would mandate a study of potential initiatives to reduce the prevalence of single-use plastic items. We would recommend amending this to more clearly stipulate an analysis of waste reduction and reuse models so that we avoid uh, a simple exploration of replacement single-use products that are marketed as recyclable or compostable or just aren't made of plastic. They, these would do little or nothing to reduce waste and associated carbon emissions. The SWABs look forward to seeing any amendments to these bills and continuing to work with the city's departments and elected officials to move towards the goal of zero waste. We thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the SWABs for all your dedication. Um, you. We're gonna invite the next panel up. Thank you for our current panelists. We have Justin Wood from the New York uh, Lawyers for Public Interests. Um, Miguel Martinez from Local 108, and we have, okay, sorry. So we'll do these two and then everyone else is on Zoom. Okay. okay. Hi, Chair Nurse. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Justin Wood. I'm the Director of Policy at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We're a member of the Transform Don't Trash New York City Coalition. Um, I also won't rehash all the statistics, many of them troubling, that we've been hearing today about declines in municipal recycling. I do think it's worth mentioning the why of why we're here and why this topic is so important. I mean, right now as we speak, Puerto Rico is underwater. People with their power, 3.2 million, I believe, U.S. citizens. Same thing is happening in Pakistan, where there's horrendous disease now spreading as a result, direct result of the climate crisis. We know now that solid waste accounts for at least 12% of New York State's emissions. It's critical that at the municipal level, as you're doing, and thank you for your leadership, that we address the amount of waste that we're burying in landfills and burning in incinerators. And for people who live near things like landfills, incinerators, or truck-based transfer stations, the recycling rate is not an abstraction or a goal that's written into law. It's also an everyday reality. I mean, for example, just eight miles from where we're sitting at City Hall, the Covanta Essex incinerator is burning 2,600 tons daily of garbage. A lot of it is coming from Manhattan. In Newark, a city where 75% of the residents are black or Latino, 
and 26% of the residents live in poverty. So everything we can do to reduce the amount that we're disposing in New York City is critical to increase environmental justice um, and tackle the climate crisis. Um, we're gonna be also, we strongly support all of the legislation um, that's been mentioned, including the bill being heard today. Um, and thank you for your leadership. We call on the speaker to advance these bills. It's obvious um, that there's a consensus developing on the city council. There's strong majority support for all of this zero waste legislation. Um, so we applaud you for, for leading on that and for the council for being on board with that. And it's, it's time for the speaker and the mayor to sign these bills into law. Um, we would also highlight the need for consistency in data collection and in public education. And in addition to all the new laws that we wanna see passed, we also join many of the other members of the public in calling for a robust implementation of the commercial waste zones policy, local law 199. Um, we've seen the same troubling decline from a very low, as far as we could tell from existing data, commercial recycling rate to an even lower one. Some of the biggest facilities in the city uh, have declined from a very low 17% or so pre-pandemic to reporting only 12% to the state DEC last year. Um, and that's just not going to get us where we need. One good example is the way other cities have built strong incentives into the commercial waste contracts that the cities have with haulers. Los Angeles has begun to make progress. They actually have a target of reducing the amount of disposed waste in each of the waste zones by 65% from 2019 to 2025. And just recently, I think just yesterday, there was an article um, that you're quoted in, Chair, uh, saying that the biggest hauler in LA, pointing some data, has actually achieved their target for the first time. So this is great. We need those same strong incentives for both generators of commercial waste and the contracted haulers to achieve those disposal targets here in New York City. So we look forward to continuing to work with you and the council to pass good legislation and to implement the laws we have already in motion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Always appreciate your testimony. Um, we're gonna hear from Miguel Martinez of Local 108. Good afternoon, my name is Miguel Martinez. I am a union shop steward and machine operator at a waste recyc recycling transfer station in the Bronx in a Thrives Neck resident. I would like to start thanking the council member Sandy Nurse and this committee for continuing to push our city to recycle and work towards a sustainable and equitable city. As we move forward, I would like for our workers to be engaged and included in the conversations, not only do we offer a great deal of knowledge, but we will signal that this council truly cares about the workforce. This industry is not easy for workers. It is incredibly dangerous and at times life-threatening. The process of recycling our garbage is fast-paced, hands-on from beginning to end, involving the use of heavy equipment like the machines that I operate. Absent of proper training, responsible management, and the provision of appropriate personal protective equipment. We will get exposed to dangerous toxins that are present in the waste stream, among other hazards. We work with, with these industrial machines that break down recyclables, where workers remove by hand any garbage that doesn't belong in the recyclables if you don't have the proper training and the right personal protective equipment, this industry, industry can cost you your life. I say all of this to paint the picture of what our jobs entails and how dangerous it is for workers. As we ask the city to recycle more, we must also push for wages to increase. We must ensure workers who are tasked with cleaning our trash have access to quality health care because our health is always on the line. Anyone doing contracts with the city must be held to strong labor standards and subsidized attached to proposals must also carry strong labor standards that include wages and benefits. I get to, I get to go home every day because I am protected at work. Local 108 has been able to collectively bargain for higher wages and safer jobs. My family, my family and I have quality health care and I get to go home to look forward to retiring with dignity. We have the power to ensure workers in the industry are well 
compensated and protected, just like me and my fellow coworkers. Thank you for your time, and I ask you to always keep us in mind. Thank you, Miguel. Um, and thank you for uh, Local 1-8 for showing up and, and being here in kind of a full force, <laughs> like holding, literally holding down one side of the room. I have a question, you said it's a machine operator. Which machine do you operate? Um, all type of machines, F excavators, payloaders, bobcats, high loans. Um, we've been trained to operate even machines we don't have, okay. you know. Can you, do you have like a, maybe an example of like a really hazardous or um, an accident or something you've seen that could highlight some of the safety needs you all have? Um, like for example, guys that work on the line, um, they have the protective gear, but sometimes they get stuck by a needle, mm. you know, and you don't know where that needle came from. There's been guys that have been gotten very sick because they got stuck by a needle. Um, when they dump demolition, they dump, all the, they dump all of that debris in the air. You don't know what's that in, what's in that container. You're breathing that. Right. You know, and we've been breathing it. I've been breathing it going on for 27 years. Um, it's very dangerous. Machines break down, fires, batteries are a major thing. We have a fire at least once a day, and we have to, we put it out ourselves. Um, I've seen fellow coworkers pass pass away, cancer, you know, hepatitis, and they've worked longer in the garbage than me. I was a teenager when I started, so it's it's very hazardous, very dangerous, and the wages and the benefits is what keeps us going, you know? Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing, and I'm looking forward in this position to holding more conversations about how we can create more protections for you all. You all are holding down so much in this city, going through the pandemic, still going to work, and so we thank you for what you do every day, and we're really hoping that, especially with the commercial waste zones, I mean, I know Justin and Eric and a lot of folks fought really hard to make sure worker protections was a key feature of that, and so we hope that this is an, an opportunity where we really can hold feet to the fire and make sure that you have what you need and those protections on your work site. So thank you for being here and being part of the conversation, and I, and I hope we can continue to grow this conversation. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have online testimony. Is there anyone here in person who wanted to testify before we move to the digital space? Okay. Um, so next we have, uh, the next panel will be Ryan Carson from Nightberg, followed by Matt Gove from Surfrider, followed by Carla Cruz from Local 108. No? No. Okay. Just Matt. Okay, so Ryan, followed by Matt, followed by Jenna Harvey. So Ryan, you can start when the announcer makes the announcement. Time has started. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Thorson Carson. I'm the Environmental Campaign Coordinator for the New York Public Interest Research Group, NYPIRG, and uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Also mention that I'm the statewide coordinator for the um, Bottle Bill Modernization Campaign as well. Um, NYPIRG applauds the New York City Council and particularly Committee Chair Nurse on its push to move New York City towards its stated solid waste goals. Banning single-use plastic fights climate change, reduces pollution, and saves the city money. However, we are concerned that this measure, while well-intentioned, simply does not go far enough. Directing the Department of Sanitation to evaluate policies to ban single-use plastics and produce a report by 2023 kicks the plastic can a little too far down the road. Um, we'd just like to see the timetable moved up a little bit. Um, the science is clear that a reliance on any plastics, not just single-use ones, is a deterrent to local and global health, and it's filling our landfills and choking our oceans now. We urge the City Council to pass compre comprehensive laws this year that ban single-use plastics outright and pass resolutions in support of two pieces of state legislation to reduce solid waste and plastic packaging, especially packaging containing plastics and toxic chemicals, and expand the state's most successful rec recycling program, the Bottle Deposit Law. The state must create an extended producer responsibility program or plastics and packaging reduction policy. 
EPR requires companies to be financially responsible for mitigating the environmental impacts of the packaging they use and sell and use to transport their products. Nearly 30% of the waste stream is packaging and much of it is unrecyclable. Other than through deposits on beverage containers through the state's successful bottle bill, companies have no financial responsibility for the waste management of product packaging and no requirements to reduce packaging waste or design packaging for recyclability. In fact, the state's draft climate action council scoping plan calls for an effective and strong extended producer responsibility program on waste reduction and expanded container deposit programs. Municipalities have simply no control over the type of packaging materials that companies put into the marketplace. Much of this is unrecyclable. The companies who are creating the packaging waste problem, including plastics and toxics contaminated packaging, should be accountable for the end of life cycle disposal and recycling of their product packaging. An effective EPR policy holds the producers responsible for the life cycle management of their products, modernizes and improves the recycling systems, and creates mandatory standards for waste reduction, recycling, and recycled content, including strong accountability and enforcement frameworks and phases out toxics and packaging. In her State of the State address, Governor Hochul outlined the need for a statewide EPR program, and the New York City Council chose to endorse the governor's Article 7 budget bill for this program in Resolution 55 in 2022. While the governor and city council's intentions were admirable, the proposed EPR program didn't go far enough. The devil, as usual, is in the details. Firstly, it has no rates or standards for reductions. Secondly, it would have opened a doorway for eliminating the state's incredibly successful Time bottle. has Close. expired. Sorry? Time has expired. Ow. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Much appreciated. Thank you all. Appreciate Be sure to put in the um, uh, testimony. Um, next, we'll hear from Matt Gove. All right, hey, uh, Matt Gove with Surfrider Foundation, and today I'm here representing Reusable NYC, which is a group of groups. We've got about 40 uh, NGOs that work in New York City to reduce plastic pollution, which is, as everyone knows, uh, it totally inundated our lives. Um, Reusable NYC, a little one second history uh, lesson was the group of groups that really pushed the bag law. Uh, many years ago, we were called Bagot NYC. Now we're reusable NYC and, and focusing on plastics. Our main goal right now is to pass the skip the, st skip the stuff bill, uh, INT 0559. Um, but we wanted to jump on today because we also support uh, this bill 0494 to do a study. Uh, I think that's a good idea. There's a lot of different options out there. Um, and, and that can give us a game plan for moving forward. We would ask for one amendment to 0494. Um, the text implies that uh, policies that focus on reusables uh, would be looked at, but it doesn't actually say reusables in the text of 0494. So it'd be nice to have that in there just to make sure we're not just focusing on changing from one single use item to another single use item. There's a lot of great ways we can switch to reusable systems, uh, which is better for uh, uh, for New Yorkers in so many ways. And I believe that's all I had. Thanks so much. Wow, thank you. Model model test testifier. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Um, next, we have Jenna Harvey, who's going to be followed by Allison Allen followed by Jacqueline Ot Otman. Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Jenna Harvey. I'm a board member at Sure We Can, a nonprofit recycling center, community space, and sustainability hub in Brooklyn. And I'm testifying today on behalf of Sure We Can. Um, so good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Nurse and to the City Council for hosting this hearing. Um, as everyone has discussed today, our city's waste crisis is already at a critical point. The issue grows more urgent by the day. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to really ap applaud Chair Nurse and her colleagues for fighting for practical, community-sensitive solutions to this overwhelming issue, and to express the hope that this council will succeed in passing comprehensive legislation that boldly moves forward in addressing the massive problems that we face including the already much discussed area of organics as well as that of plastic. Um, so at our organization, sure we can, we serve canners or the folks who collect and redeem bottles and cans to earn income. And we know firsthand the volume and the impact of plastic waste because our community has spent the past four decades since the enactment of New York State's bottle bill 
picking up plastic bottles that others thoughtlessly discard. So we know the effort that it takes to meaningfully collect and, and as a community of a thousand civilians to get the job done. So many of the schemes and the systems proposed in institutional or policy development contexts to deal with the plastic waste crisis ring hollow and come off as short-sighted because they let plastic producers off the hook, avoiding strong accountability systems like concrete reduction targets, and often they undermine systems like the bottle bill. Um, the bottle bill encourages average people to participate. Um, and so th this rose-colored approach is not sufficient, and at best, it merely kicks the can or the bottle, as it were, down the road, into the gutter, and out into the ocean to join the tons of plastic that are floating there. At worst, it is counterproductive and simply serves to reward those who are destroying our world. So it's worth repeating, it takes a village, and any solution to the waste crisis that will be truly effective in the long term has to include and empower communities, and especially those communities that have borne the burdens of profit-driven madness and indiscriminate waste and pollution for decades. So a system like the bottle bill works because it's incredibly effective at uh, producing positive environmental outcomes. 70% litter reduction, hundreds of thousands of tons of waste diverted at no cost to the taxpayer, and positive environmental justice outcomes. Our center alone distributes around $700,000 annually to informal recyclers most of whom come from highly marginalized demographics, while contributing to the betterment of the neighborhoods that are plagued by plastic, air, and water pollution. So just to sum up, we have so much to gain and to save by focusing on inclusion, Time empowerment, and effectiveness over profit and inconvenience. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Um, really appreciate your testimony today. Um, next up, we have Allison Allen. Time has started. I'm Allison Allen. I'm a Manhattan Swab member and chair of the Organics Committee. It was an unexpected surprise to see the organics expanded throughout Queens, and we hope this is just the beginning towards a citywide expansion. We hope there's excitement and momentum building in Queens, but we also have the concerns that the lack of marketing and education could result in lackluster results in early phases. We're concerned that the program is currently designed, ends after the three months, uh, and we all said no, that stopping and starting is not, way, not a good way to achieve success. So we urge the mayor and the council not to rush to any early judgments. We hope the program will be given the time needed to allow DSNY and the council to find the funding required to adequately promote the program, work through the initial issues, and ultimately bring more awareness about why this is an important program. We need to do much more to ensure the overall population understands how organics, methane emissions, and zero waste connects to climate change, as well as the taxpayer dollars spent to export waste that is really not waste, to hope, and hopefully that will prompt change in their behavior. We should also identify more Climate Week-type opportunities and collaborate with those organizations to push out waste-related messaging. The organics program in the seven districts is experiencing a number of problems, including building management resistance and lack of participation, which hopefully are also being addressed as a priority. We need more transparency and data on the New York City open data portal to be shared and analyzed in order to develop targeted approaches to boost engagement and participation. Uh, the commissioner said that she has concerns about mandatory organics, and I've heard concerns about how enforcement is a concern and needs to be addressed, but I, can ima I, I don't see why a grace period or other workarounds could be developed similar to other laws. In prior testimony, I've outlined how we can find funding from the reduction in export contract payments resulting from the decrease of organics. Uh, we can expect in the export waste stream with mandatory. These dollars can be allocated towards building the local infrastructure to process organics locally, partnerships with other agencies, Department of Health, DOE, DOT, uh, Link NYC are key and offer opportunities, budgets, and marketing assets that should be leveraged to support organics, especially DOH's RAT portal. Council members on the relevant committee should be discussing organics and all these other agency committee meetings. 
uh, SWAB has an uh, organics recycling guide we're going to distribute. It'd be helpful to know the DSNY's marketing plan, especially with the holidays coming up, including Halloween pumpkins. Tremendous opportunity and timely opportunity to promote composting. So we urge the council to continue pushing for equitable mandatory organics program and implementing immediately in the seven districts with it's service expired. test and tweak tactics uh, to ensure a su successful rollout citywide. And Time we hope has expired. are managed accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate your testimony. Um, we actually have someone who came in person, uh, Solomon Bleacher, Bleacher, would you like to testify? Well, you're welcome to, to sit and read your testimony if you want. We could go to the next person if you need a minute. Okay, great. So we'll go to Jacqueline Ottman. Time has begun. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Nurse and other committee members. I'm Jackie Ottman, an expert on marketing environmentally preferable products and behaviors to consumers. I'm immediate past chair of the Manhattan Swab and the principal author of their guides summarizing best practices for improving recycling and organics participation in New York City multifamily buildings. I also teach recycling to superintendents and other building workers in the local 32 BJ. To enhance recycling in New York City, please consider the following. I suspect that the recycling rate in New York City's multifamily buildings is even less than the natural national average, which itself is only half of that for single family homes. Why? Two key challenges, diversity. Half of New Yorkers don't speak English as a primary language and the transient nature of New York City residents. Getting residents to sort properly and keep up with the constant stream of new residents primarily flows directly to building staff who are ill-equipped to play recycling educator and monitor. A strong chorus supports large-scale communications efforts, as do I. Until funding can be found, there are other less costly ideas that can be explored. First, require clear bags instead of black for trash, even just on a periodic basis so it's easier to spot recyclables. Two, require mandatory lease riders with annual reminders the purpose to notify residents of their recycling responsibilities and how recycling works in their own building. Three, require mandatory zero waste training for building staff who often don't understand themselves how and why to recycle. My final suggestion is to reinstate the citywide recycling advisory board. The CRAB was required by local law 19 of 1989 beyond the borough wide solid waste advisory boards. It last met around 2010. It convened two roundtables that included experts from other cities. They made significant contributions into the design of SIMS, our current city supported MRF, and our organic systems. Boston and Portland have such boards composed of representatives from various city agencies and other sectors. A great goal would be to sit such a zero waste advisory board for New York in time to inform the next comprehensive swamp due for adoption by 2026. Thank you for the opportunity to present these remarks and for holding these hearings. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next person, uh, Adam Peer. Time good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Adam Peer. I'm the Senior Director for Packaging and Consumer Products at the American Chemistry Council. And I have three points that I would like to share with members today. First is that the American Chemistry Council is committed to more circular economy for plastics. Second, public policy should be determined by data and science. 
And lastly, any sort of study of this nature should take into consideration the fair consideration of all economic and environmental benefits of plastics. In addition to submitting written testimony later today, uh, I will supply the committee with a suggested amendment. So first, with respect to the uh, circularity of plastics, we have set a goal that all plastic packaging in the United States uh, should be reusable, recyclable, or recoverable by 2040, and that all plastic packaging is recyclable or recoverable by 2030. On evidence-based public policy, to make decisions, the study should be expanded to study the comp comparative benefits and resources of all materials over the entire life cycle. And the study should also consider how to make all materials more circular. The study should also recognize the overall impact to landfilling, climate change, energy use, et cetera, that alternatives may pose. And lastly, on fair consideration. As proposed, the elements of this bill suggest that eliminating plastic items is always the environmental preferable choice. However, plastics play an important role in reducing landfilling, lightening climate impact, providing a function at a lower cost, among many other important benefits. And this study should, and these should be recognized in the study. We believe that with these changes, the city will have better information to make informed decisions. And we also urge the city to consider other actions that we've put together in the American Chemistry Council's five actions for sustainable change. Again, thank you for your consideration and look forward to supplying the written comments and suggested amendment language for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And um, you ready, Solomon? All right, we're excited for you. Take your time, no rush. Uh, good, good afternoon, Chairwoman Nurse and members of the Sanitation Committee. My name is Solomon Blecker and I am in 10th grade at Nest Plus M. I live in the East Village in New York. I am uh, speaking to support the New York study of single use plastics. Uh, in my neighborhood, there's a lot of garbage and uh, we're, we're known for rat problems even compared to other parts of New York. There are a lot of rats and no one likes rats. Um, they feed on the amount of garbage and it's not, it's not nice to look at. So we should study the impacts of this and come up with a solution. Uh, additionally, 89% of plastic in the ocean is single use plastic, which harms all living things in the ocean as well as ourselves. Uh, we need to stop this problem and New York banning single use plastics and studying this would not only reduce plastic waste in New York, but also inspire other cities to do the same. We need to take a stand and that starts now. We need to not let companies get away with polluting our oceans and selling us things that destroy our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. 10th uh, grade? Yes. You said 10th grade? Wow, thank you for being here. Are you gonna be out for the student strike on Friday? I hope so, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you for testifying. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, love when the youth come to testify. And next online, I think we have Mary Arnold. Time has begun. Thank you, Chair, Nurse, and Committee members. Please stick to your zero waste goal and incorporate comment you received from Borough President Reynoso, the swabs and NRDC today. We learned today that construction and demolition debris, also called CND, is included in DSNY's waste characterization study. We heard from Local 108 today about the hazards of handling and breathing CND. However, so far, none of the proposed legislation touches CND, which comprises the majority of landfilled waste tonnage. CND was also specifically excluded from the new commercial waste zone law. Other world cities like London already have plans for reducing and recycling construction materials, including gypsum wallboard that emits toxic hydrogen sulfide gas when it decomposes in landfills. When now Attorney General Letitia James was New York City Council Sanitation Committee Chair, 
She held a hearing on intro 1170, where testimony was given by civic organizations, residents, and unions about the adverse impacts CND facilities have on residents and workers. Please make CND recycling part of the city's recycling planning. The city is a major exporter of CND to landfills and other jurisdictions, including environmental justice communities. Environmental justice communities in New York City, including in Queens, are adversely impacted by CND processes and facilities, in part because the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation considers CND processing facilities with three walls and a roof fully enclosed and because CND transfer stations always are served by trucks. Trucks bring the CND to transfer stations and then truck it directly to landfills or across the region to waste by rail transfer stations. Waste by rail transfer stations are a growth industry that has enjoyed foreign investment by Macquarie in the New York City area, including in environmental justice communities. During permitting of transfer stations, New York State DEC does not consider cumulative adverse environmental or health impacts or impacts beyond the immediate site of a transfer station. There is another new Suffolk County waste by rail facility seeking a federal permit to haul CND and burner ash. Waste by rail is hauled from Suffolk County in open rail cars that emit waste, blow off leachate and odors in New York City neighborhoods. New York State environmental law says that trucks have to haul CND under covers, but trains don't. The polluting rail cars are hauled by high polluting 1970s locomotives that adversely impact community air quality and exacerbate climate change. Please ensure that New York City Time has expired. How to reduce and recycle more CND tonnage and reduce its health and environmental impacts on New York City residents. Thank you so much for the work you're doing on Zero Waste, uh, Chair Nurse, and, and your committee, and DSNY. Thank you so much. And please pay attention to the comments from the swabs. Uh, Civics, Envi uh, Civics United for Environmental Solutions, uh, Railroad Envi excuse me, Civics United for Railroad Environmental Solutions, and I'm representing, is a member of the uh, Queen Swab. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, next, we have Anna Sachs, who's going to be followed by Michelle Greenberg, followed by Georgina Page. Time has begun. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having this hearing. My name is Anna. I'm a member of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee. Um, one is just related to, the, to what we heard from DSNY. Um, when we're doing the waste characterization study, I think it would be really useful to have reuse also as a category that DSNY is studying so we can finally quantify what is actually usable as the curb. Um, another is where, where the Queens Organics is going, and if it's going to Newtown Creek, how do they treat yard waste? Is it actually going to be beneficially used? Um, and an ongoing issue is also the biosolids produced from Newtown Creek being beneficially used. For NYCHA, um, even in NYCHA developments that have recycling bins, oftentimes they're lined with black trash liners, and oftentimes the compactors are just for trash. So there really is no place for NYCHA residents to recycle, even if they do want to do so. Um, for organics, one thing I want to mention is that I think parks needs to follow the DSNY laws, the commercial laws, where 10% or more of your waste consists of organic matter, you must beneficially use that um, and compost it. And parks currently is not actually beneficially using all of the uh, organic waste that it generates. So I just suggest that the city also follow the laws that they um, impose on the commercial entities. Um, for recycling, I, I think we need more transparency about where we send our recyclable commodities. So even if once it enters the secondary market, where does it go? If I put my black sushi container into the recycling bin, which I currently do as a rigid plastic, um, is it then bundled as a mixed plastic and shipped overseas to a country that doesn't have the proper recycling infrastructure? Um, if that is indeed the case, I will stop recycling those type of plastics, low value plastics, because I don't want to contribute to another country's environmental issues, its degradation and polluting other countries. Um, so I think that it would be beneficial for all of us to know where exactly our recyclables go. Um, I think also we should have more transparency about what actually has a market and 
if we find that consistently certain materials don't have a market, then we should we should be allowed that information and then be able to make different choices based off of it. Um, I think we also need, in addition to a single-use plastic study, uh, local man remanufacturing capacity. So how much of, what would it take for all of our recyclables to be pr processed in New York City or within the New York City region? Um, and another thing related to um, if we're shipping it overseas, um, California has proposed that if you ship certain materials overseas, um, that it be counts as trash, landfill incineration, rather than recycling. And that's another way of getting at um, disincentivizing sending recy certain recyclables overseas to places that have that don't have the capacity. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Next up, we have Michelle Greenberg. Time has begun. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Greenberg, and I'm a volunteer with 350 Brooklyn. <clears throat> For many years, I've seen the heartbreaking images of plastic garbage floating out in the ocean. I also recently learned that almost all plastic is made from fossil fuels and that plastic use has increased exponentially in the past few years. This means that the manufacture of plastic harms us not only through pollution of land and wasteways, plastic production is energy intensive, produces greenhouse gas emissions, and if production increases at the current rate, is expected to account for 15 to 19 percent of total carbon emissions by 2050. Learning all this has been upsetting and made me want to do everything I could to reduce the amount of plastic I use in my daily life. I also started to notice how much of my food and cleaning supplies come in plastic packages, many which are not recyclable. Right now, in order to stop buying food and personal hygiene products that come in plastic packaging, I would have to stop buying cereal, meat, pasta, yogurt, cheese, and many types of bread, vegetables, and fruit, not to mention toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, dishwashing liquid, and detergent to wash clothes. So despite my valiant efforts to use less plastic, there's currently very little that I can do if I wanna keep eating and stay clean. Clearly something has to happen on the governmental level. Fortunately, as has been mentioned, Important in initiatives have already been proposed at the state level, which use extended producer responsibility, EPR, where financial and physical responsibility for recycling and reuse is shifted away from the general public to producers. This also includes the use of incentives to incorporate environmental consideration into the design of their products and packaging. These EPR initiatives include a proposal to revamp the New York State Bottle Bill by upgrading and modernizing our bottle return system. The proposed modernizations include updating bottle return machines and increasing the number of drop-off sites, deposit amounts from, point, from 5 cents to 10 cents per bottle, and the types of bottles that can be returned. Because bottles and cans are, reduced, are redirected away from landfills and dumps, in New York State, this will mean that $5.4 billion, billion, uh, billion additional beverage containers will be recycled each year, resulting in an annual reduction of 331,900 metric tons of CO2 and savings of $70.9 million annually. These proposed actions are brilliant, need to be enacted right away, have been shown to work in Maine, Portland, Oregon, Canada, and Europe, save money, and go a long way to save our planet. Unfortunately, the original bill that was proposed close to two years ago wasn't included in Governor Hochul's budget. But if New York City would once again take the lead and pass a similar bill here, along with scheduling votes for all of the com composting and zero waste legislation that's currently pending a vote, we would have the opportunity to make this planet sa planet saving model a reality and show the rest of our state, country, and Time world that stopping climate change is not only possible, but can be a win-win for everybody, including individuals, governments, and corporations. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we're gonna hear our last few folks are Georgina Page, Lyric Thompson, and then Sharon Silberman will close us out. Time has begun. Good afternoon, fellow citizens, advocates, chair nurse, and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste, Waste Management and Department of Sanitation. Thank you for your commitment to these issues. My name is Georgie Page, and I'm an organizer with 350 Brooklyn. We're an environmental organization that works locally to fight the global climate crisis with a focus on fossil fuels. My concern is mainly with plastics and their incredible damage to our environment and our bodies from the beginning to the end of their life cycle. 
There are microplastics in our oceans, animal life, the food we eat, and in the placentas, in our placentas at the very beginning of life. It has to stop immediately, immediately. So I'm here today to voice my frustration at the lack of action and progress on six to seven common sense waste bills that are pending in the city council and which I believe should be scheduled for a vote as soon as possible if we are to meet our climate goals. And we must meet our city's climate goals because there is no other option. For the vast majority of us who aren't Jeff Bezos with a rocket ship, life is short and there is no planet B. Number one, climate recycling is a critical component of New York City's 20-year climate plan. Um, Cost-wise, exporting our garbage to other communities in other states is not a solution. and costs New York City taxpayers $290 million um, in 2007, I'm sure it's a lot more now, not including the cost of collection. With better recycling, we will earn money instead of spending it. Pollution, this is really um, high up there too. Failure to recycle plastics properly in particular is leading to more and more burning of waste and to toxic chemicals poisoning our air and water. We are using way more plastics than is necessary, not because we need them, because, but because the oil industry, the chemical industries, they want the profits. So they pay for legislation and lobbyists and mandates to support the production and use of more plastics. And they fight any legislation that seeks to limit plastics. We are watching this closely. We are watching them closely. For these reasons, it's not enough to simply commit to pilots. We must accelerate and redouble our efforts to pass laws, the laws citywide that the citizens want. Our organization supports all of the zero waste legislation that has been proposed. And as we table every weekend, this legislation is also overwhelmingly supported by the citizens of Brooklyn. They are clamoring to sign on in support. They even give us their email addresses. So C 350 Brooklyn reflects the opinions of these citizens. And we ask that you redouble your efforts to work backward from the goal of saving the planet and pass the following legislation with haste, especially including support within the city for extended producer responsibility, as Michelle mentioned, um, at the state level. We must leave no stone unturned and we must ask more of our citizens because they do care. They are paying attention. Um, Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. Um, really appreciate your testimony today. And um, Sharon Silberman is going to close us out. Time has begun. Oh. I'm Sharon Silberman testifying as the Textile Committee Chair for the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. New Yorkers throw 400 million pounds of apparel and textiles into our municipal waste stream annually. Our charities, overrun with donations, ship mountains of leftover foreign, to foreign markets, unable to absorb this excess. In turn, what gets unsold gets dumped onto their beaches and their oceans and deserts. Designers and brands sort of version materials because they're deceptively cheap, plus there's not enough recycled fiber at scale to satisfy the demand. Virgin fiber production into textiles accounts for the majority of GHGs in fashion, along with the water and energy used in the agricultural and manufacturing processes. Recycled fibers eliminate virtually all virgin fiber processing. New York State recently introduced the Textiles Act aimed at developing an animal and plant fiber textile manufacturing industry. New York State also introduced the Fashion Act, which would hold apparel manufacturers responsible for mapping supply chains, reporting impacts, setting reduction goals, and disclosing their materials usage. These, along with federal initiatives to reshore production and invest in recycling that builds the circular economy, begs the question why New York City isn't aggressively pursuing circular textile recycling as a green industry capable of supporting all these legislative proposals while developing a multi-billion dollar opportunity right here in New York City, where we have both circular city and zero waste initiatives. Apparel and textiles are responsible for roughly 8% of global GHG emissions. Per sanitation's characterization, textiles are 6% of New York City's waste stream. Their collection, transportation, and disposal cost $93 million in 2018. Textiles are the fastest growing of all waste stream categories. The industry is forecasted to grow an additional 63% by 2030. Ironically, our deadline for lowering GHGs by 50% and achieving zero waste. If unaddressed, this would increase New York City's annual textile waste to 625 million pounds and skyrocket costs to $150 million, $51 million annually in just seven years. This should be spent on curbside collection 
education, sorting, and building circular recycling infrastructure. 65% of our wardrobes are polyester, which never biodegrades, while natural fiber content produces methane in anaerobic landfill conditions. At scale, recycled content should cost no more than virgin content, whose real cost is never realized in the environmental and health harms it causes. This is the basis for a need for effective textile EPR legislation for embedding blockchain for transparency to consumers and fiscal responsibility by manufacturers when their products end of life cost taxpayer millions in waste management fees. Please use your position to make the only choices that make sense, and please let the MSWAB help you create effective legislation and implement measures to achieve zero waste for apparel and textiles. I'm also going to represent the Residential Recycling and Reuse Committee. I'll make three points concerning the state of recycling in residential buildings. The first concerns educating residents about why and how of recycling. The, to optimize participation and drive efficient resident behavior, we advocate here for sufficient resources to explain the science and to reinforce the message that when we engage in proper waste diversion, we greatly reduce the quantity of trash that goes to landfills and incinerators. In turn, this reduces global warming and disproportionate burdens on environmental justice communities. Methane created in landfill conditions is 25 times more potent at, than carbon dioxide at trapping heat in the atmosphere. To achieve optimal waste diversion and correctly separate recyclables and organics, residents need to learn why this is so important and how to do it properly. Currently, the Department of Sanitation devotes just 50 cents per person annually for overall education and outreach, as compared, for example, to San Francisco and Seattle, which allocates $3 per person annually. Our sanitation department must do more to educate the public and make waste diversion less confusing as well as mandatory. Our second point concerns establishing a lease rider, which would explain to new and potential residents that recycling is required under the law and how to correctly comply. Details provided at lease signing, when people tend to be more focused and attentive, will help correct confusion about how to recycle. By educating residents on recycling, landlords and co-op boards demonstrate that they're serious about recycling rules. The result is that building waste management staff will spend less time on correcting recycling and organics diversion mistakes. The lease rider would be a requirement for all buildings in New York City, just as recycling itself is required. Does the city want to add requirements for building managers to handle? Are recycling requirements worthy, worth having? Mandating curbside composting would yet be another requirement and is the third point we want to cover. In our current voluntary composting program, residents who want to divert their food, yard, and food soiled paper waste may not have access to an organic composting option if their building managers or co-op boards simply do not want to participate in the program. Non-participation reduces diversion rates, raising the collection costs per pound that is Has diverted. Expired? Making voluntary Can I just finish? making a voluntary program too expensive to support. Mandating participation means that building managers and co-op boards would lack the freedom to choose how they manage organic waste streams that in landfills produce dangerous methane. Freedom of choice is an American value that we might respect if adhering to it wouldn't mean less tonnage to landfills and incinerators and less damage to the environment. Mandated recycling and organics collection is intended to protect the public at large from increasingly serious impacts of the climate crisis caused by overconsumption and reckless production of greenhouse gases in landfills and incinerators. Mandated citywide organics collection for all residential buildings, especially in a city of eight and a half million with a zero waste and circular city initiatives is the only way we will achieve these climate goals in an affordable manner. No mandates may mean less drama for building managers, but substantial drama and enormous public expense when we experience flooding, drought, fires, and record heat and cold temperatures. Let's support mandated curbside composting and reduce the likelihood of environmental hazards. Thank you all very much, and thank you for letting me continue. Thank you, Sharon. Yes, gave some extra time since you are our last person to close us out. You got lucky. Um, but thank you so much for everyone who has joined. I want to thank our committee staff. Thank you so much. And for Andrew and Ricky who are online and the folks who are holding down the courtroom and the audio tech. Thank you for everyone who stayed and listened. Appreciate all of your passion and your attention to this important matter. Thank you for staying. <laughs> um, you know, it's climate week, so it's an important week, and we hope that, I hope that you all have these conversations. Let's grow this room. Um, we, we generally have the choir um, that comes to our hearings, but we'd love to be able to 
have more folks come and, and chime in. So let's use this week and the momentum generated by it to really grow these conversations. And thank you so much. I also encourage everyone who really cares about the zero waste package to send a note to the speaker, send a letter, encourage the bill to come to the floor, the package of bills, they're great bills and we'd love to see them pass. So we need to keep the, the momentum going on it. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And I'm gonna close out our hearing today.